And we are back with another I'm Not GM Speed Chess Championship match. Aman, I'm so glad to have you back today with what's the first quarterfinal matchup of this year's edition. Yeah, the uh, the tournaments are, are you know very exciting. And the I am not a GM. I always get this feeling like I can't wait to come back for our, you know, I miss a day because the, the match happens really early. And it's always nice to be back for the commentary of the next match. For sure. And we have a fun one in store for everyone today because it's Lawrence Trent against Roberto Molina. And, you know, we need to make some predictions, Aman. Who are you going with? Yeah, R Roberto Molina is actually one of the matches that I didn't commentate the first round of. I um, commentated a lot of these matches, but that's one of the one I didn't, uh, didn't see. So I think he was playing Alessia Santoramo. Um, he ended up winning the match pretty convincingly, um, which is what we might expect. But uh, he's actually a player that I've only really known online. So I've played him a lot online in like bullet chess, especially. And the most that I know about him, he's a very, very tricky bullet player, a uh, very strong bullet player. Him and I have played a lot of matches. So I, I only really know about his bullet chess. And Lawrence, I mean, I don't think we really got to see him flex his muscles. I mean, at the end of the day, Robert, he only played Danny Ranch. <laughs> I won't go so far as to agree with you there, but Danny was not in his best shape. But Lawrence was extremely impressive. And we know that he's tweeted about wanting to become a grandmaster. He says, it's now's the time I'm going to put my mind to it. So if he is taking that task seriously and he's preparing, that means that this could be his last time playing the I'm not GM speech championship. Yeah, that's right. No, I'm very excited to see Lawrence uh, <laughs> take something like the Grandmaster title seriously. I actually saw a tweet from Attila Turzo, another uh, streamer who said he was going for the GM title. So uh, I love to see this uh, dedication from some of the players to the Grandmaster title. And Roberto Molina is another guy, you know, with his style, he could definitely go for the Grandmaster title pretty soon as well. For sure. And let's remind everybody of what we're here for, what the format is like. We will have 75 minutes of five minute plus one second increment blitz, followed by 45 minutes of the three plus one. And then ultimately we get to the bullet chest, 25 minutes of that. And as is always the case, only one winner will be crowned today. They will move on to the semifinals, but come on, the prize fund getting bigger. So for those who are still in the competition and they can keep on going, they'll be enjoying uh, this final stretch here. Yeah, this is a, a nice, nice prize fund for the players. And it the, the thing that I like about it is that it keeps the match interesting the whole way. You know, if the match finishes 10-9, where the match finishes you know, 20 to zero, that's a much different payout for the players. So um, I like the format and the way that the prizes are distributed, that it keeps the match uh, exciting for us, even if we already know who's going to uh, you know, win the match. For sure. And let's uh, remind everybody how we got here. You mentioned that uh, Roberto, he did beat Alessia. That was in a uh, points odds match. He was very impressive to storm back. And Lawrence Trent probably had the single most impressive first round because he, mm -hmm. at least on paper, by seeding, he was the underdog, but he didn't look any bit that part. He was there to shine against Danny Wrench. And I think when he plays his quote-unquote nemesis, he the, brings the best out of him. So he wants yeah. to play the Greg Shahadis of the world. And that's why he's playing so well is he sees Greg on the other side of the bracket. He wants them to meet in the final. Yeah, and you bring up such an interesting point. And I think uh, I think it plays uh, exactly into the character of Lawrence Trent. Um, I'm actually wondering, to your point, whether he views uh, his opponent today in that light. And I don't think he does. I, I don't think that he really knows that much about his opponent. You know, he he can drum up the hype in his usual way with a few tweets and stuff like that. But when he's playing Danny Ranch, when he's playing Greg Shahadi, John Bartholomew, you know, you really, as you said, it brings the best out of him and uh, he, he thrives in that environment. So I feel like today with, with an opponent from Brazil that he might know a bit less about and he's definitely a very strong, solid player in his own right, that uh, this could be a very tough match just stylistically for, for Lawrence. Yeah, and I think that something can be misleading. It's that with an odds match, as Roberto played in the first round, you're going to play totally different openings. Right? If you need to win to catch up, you will play sharper chess. You will do different things than if you're starting 0-0 or 2-2, two two, right? So that happens in every single sport. When your back's against the wall, you need to play something for a win. You need to take risks. And so I'm going to be curious how Roberto starts this match and for Lawrence, how he manages his clock, because sometimes he goes into the think tank and that's when it spells trouble for many of these players. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great point as well. And of course, full, full credit to, to Lawrence because 
people uh, like to sell Danny short, you know, myself included, but at the end of the day, Danny's an incredibly strong player, especially when he shows up. Um, and, and Lawrence was able to beat him by a pretty convincing margin. So, um, that, that match really says to me that Lawrence can, can, you know, win this whole thing. Like he's capable of that, um, this event. So, uh, if Lawrence shows up the same way he did against Danny, he has those tricky openings that uh, what we noticed from his style in that last match is that, um, he had opening systems that you know, he really, he really knew, and he was willing to play over and over. And Danny wasn't able to solve them quickly. And Lawrence was getting way up on the clock and using that to his advantage as we see the five-minute portion uh, just getting underway. And we spoke to Krikor Mikatarian, the beloved uh, head of Portuguese content for chess.com, a great streamer in his own right, and compatriot of Roberto Molina. He says that Roberto goes to his Caracons, his tried and true opening, and he says, I'm going to stop playing it at some point, and he never does. But we have a very strange start to this with the B2 pawn. Is that poison Amon or is Roberto going to get away with it? Um, well, I think that the answer can be yes and yes to that, to that uh, <laughs> series of questions. Uh, I think it is probably one of those poison pawns where you can see the evaluation bar on the left-hand side hovering around the, 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 you know, the center of the board, which is more around equal territory. And to beat down a pawn and still have a position that is around equal usually indicates that there's pretty good compensation. So um, I think it is sort of a poison pawn variation. Um, Lawrence is already starting with the H pawn, you know, knight G to E2, and he's just got easy kingside pressure. When as soon as this knight develops in black castles, you're going to see that bishop come to H6 for for Lawrence. And I think this is sort of his style. It's more of a more of a tricky sort of blitz type of opening to be down upon already. I agree. And the plans for white actually are pretty easy. E5 now actually comes to tempo. I was going to suggest it even if the knight went to E7. Now mm -hmm. you can go for G4, eventually knight F4, maybe a sacrifice on G6. And even if some of it is speculative, in blitz chess, these kind of sacrifices almost always work. So uh, I would be looking at that kind of quick attack. And there we see Lawrence goes right forward. And look at how much more development he has. He has all yeah. four minor pieces out there. Look at Black's queenside, completely stuck, useless to fend off the attack that's about to happen and the sacrifice in the G6 square. So knight of eight is a good move. Yeah, and, and the knight going to F6 means that uh, the, maybe the more natural development of like knight E7, knight D7 is it possible? So what you're going to see here is you're going to see some of the pieces sort of bumping into each other. The bishop on g7 is not that great hitting these pawns. Black can't even challenge the center with c5 because knight b5, knight d6 is always killer. So he sort of has to play like a6 to, to prepare c5, but at the same time, this bishop needs to get out. So you got to go b6 to get the bishop out. There's just so many different plans that seem to overlap. And what I'm seeing from the position right now is that uh, Black's pieces they, they don't feel like they can develop comfortably here. And Lawrence has, you know, one plan and he's, he's just executing it. Although knight to e2, now you can play c5 because what you were just saying was absolutely correct. That c5 you want to play, but can't if the knight jumps into b5 and into d6. But that knight went to e2. So now feels like the time to go c5. And I understand that there will be risk. The b5 score is still white for the taking with a perhaps a bishop b5 check. But I need to get active. I need to free the C6 square for my knight. I need to make sure I can fully develop. Otherwise, I'm sitting and doing nothing. Yep. And A6 played, which I think has to do with exactly that square and probably the C5 move incoming. But I just don't know if you have time for, for moves like this. And C4, I, I, I kind of like as a, as a reply, he's going to take it and maybe he's going to try to establish a knight on D5. But hang on, that E4 square, uh, Robert, just became available after D takes C4. And I think that Roberto Molina might regret that. He's definitely going to regret it because his bishop on g7 isn't actually doing much of anything. That's like his one developed piece. Everything else, all of his minors and his rooks on the first rank, the eighth rank in yeah. this case. So he brings a knight to d7. I'm already looking. What was that knight doing? Covering the g6 pawn. Can I get away with bishop takes e6, knight takes g6, a sacrifice of a piece for two pawns, but you also get that rook in the corner? No, he yeah. plays... Well, I was going to say more tamely, but that's a king on g3. So <laughs> I don't know if that's very tame chess. Yeah, I, I don't know what uh, he might be thinking, like whether he just wants to bring his king to like eight, the h file, like thinking that it's more castled or more safe over there. Um, I have to say, I don't really get this move because, hey, the king is so safe on f2. Um, g4 is one of the main ideas it looks like he might go for. And this kind of stops like both of them. It's, you know, less safe on G3, more susceptible to checks. Uh, I have to say, I just don't really, don't really get that move. It doesn't look terrible, but it looks unnecessary. Right. And also makes it harder to attack because if you sacrifice a piece, 
you're opening up the board and your king is on g3. So right. now knight is coming to d6. That's a problem. I believe that Roberto, he has to just say, doesn't look great, but maybe I should just castle kingside. I, I think I'm going to get attacked and probably checkmated regardless of what I do. So I, he does it, but right. I'm, I wouldn't be happy about it. Yeah, this this castling, I, I think I feel a little bit better doing this now that the king is here, though. Uh, in all honesty, if that king was there, I'd be like, okay, G4 is coming and, you know, bad things are happening to good people. Um, but, but Bishop look at, G5. Great move, right? Instead of just moving the knight, Bishop G5 hits the queen, establishes the F6 square as the knights for the taking. And yeah, knight F6 check. This could be a very quick game at this point. Yeah, he's, he's going to take with the bishop. Do you think he's going to take that or just go king h8? Man, if this king was on f2, this would be game over in like a couple <laughs> moves. That's true, right? Because uh, <laughs> there are some tactics revolving around the fact the e5 pawn is pinned. Well, not as much anymore, but there could be a moment you play bishop h6. I could take your knight on f6, and you can't right. take me back. So rook c1, what a calm move. And yeah. threads to win a pawn on d5. So developing bishop e6, I don't love rook c1 it feels like it's giving black time but i see the eval bar is through the roof yeah i i would move the king and you know f4 g4 or maybe both of them uh, those those are the moves i want to do basically if you play g4 and they take it h5 will win the game immediately uh, I think getting that rook involved is checkmate for sure although because it says like plus nine or whatever i can't really see it's all the way up knight takes h5 and bishop f6 probably just leads to checkmate Knight h5, bishop f6. Damn. Not, not any, queen h6. Not anymore because the knight came to d7. This is why I didn't like rook c1. It wasn't right. even because I spotted the tactic right away. It's because it took time and it has a purpose to it. But now mm -hmm. if I'm Roberto, I'm trying to strike back. Can I play a c5 move? Probably not. I don't think I have time to do so. But that's the kind of thing that black needs. Maybe a queen b6. or You get the point. I need yeah. to strike back. And now the e5 pawn is hanging in addition to the d4 pawn being under attack. Definitely. Uh, I love queen f4, um, first glance type of move. Um, sort of covers both of those pawns at the same time. Um, now the king on g3 makes a lot of sense, by the way. So <laughs> it's not like we can play it right away, but I like queen f4, king g3 if necessary, and, and sort of just continue our plan over here. Uh, goes queen e3, similar idea. I feel like f4 was a little closer to the action. Agreed. Though with g takes h5, the next move to be played, it feels like Black's King is going to be harassed no matter what. So this looks like a checkmate on the horizon. And I have to say, Lawrence has played this game very well. And yes. Roberto probably should not go back to this opening. As you said from the get-go, this is Lawrence's style. And what we spoke about with uh, Krikor, uh, Mkhitaryan, he was saying that Roberto likes to trade pieces. He is of the schooling of Ulf Anderson, the like of, let's trade pieces, get to the end game, and I'll play you. This is sure. anything but that. Anything but that. Now, if you're trading pieces, you're only helping yourself get, get mated here. So he's probably not happy with his prospects. Queen e3, nice move. Let's take stock of the time as well. You know, a minute ticking down for Roberto. And not only does he have the tougher position, but, you know, head in his hands right now on cam. He, he knows that, the, that this is just uh, hopeless, uh, hopeless defensive task. And I didn't even notice this, but... Look at the rating differential between these two. Roberto's rating is 2760. Lawrence is 2570 in Blitz. That's like 200 rating points. And yet in game one, Lawrence says, you think I care about that number? I'm on that path. I'm trying to make progress. Let me go and just checkmate your king. So rookie A played, do not take that rook. That's funny, right? Normally you just you take your rook with your knight. That yeah. sounds like a good trade, but Why just not? go for the checkmate. Don't waste your time. Yeah. yeah. No, he, he knows. Okay, so Bishop takes F6. He wants I, I think he wants, uh, or Roberto rather wants, like Bishop takes f6, some sort of queen h6, pawn takes, blundering, you know, queen d4 takes f6. But what he's going to do is he's going to take first with the pawn on f6 to threaten queen h6, made in two. Um, mm -hmm. Must be king g8 um, oh, to gosh. keep playing this game. Oh, just h takes g6 and h5. I mean, yeah. all the pawns are coming. <laughs> <laughs> this doesn't look very pleasant. The nasty thing is after h5, you're threatening like <laughs> almost queen h6. Like <laughs> you could really hurt the guy. Bishop g6 is a nice touch from uh, from Lawrence as well there. And and Roberto's going to resign. What a resounding first game there uh, from, from Lawrence, Robert. That was super impressive. 
he just made a fantastic player look like he's, you know, 400 ready points lower. And that goes yeah. to show that when Lawrence is playing his best and stylistically, when he gets that kind of position, he can really thrive. But Roberto now with the white pieces, let's see if he can even the score up. We're getting a Kings Indian defense. This is standard stuff here. And I get the feeling that we're not going to see the sharp lines where white plays D5, black plays you know, pawn F5. And then we have a, essentially white pushing on the queen side, black mm-hmm. trying to check him in the king side. Because I feel like Roberto does not want that kind of tactical battle. Exactly. Um, so we'll see what he goes for. Because to me, Lawrence is not going to be saying no to that. <laughs> so we've got one player who's going to agree to play that sort of style. Um, it just depends how Roberto wants to go. And H5 played already. I have to say, that seems like a bit of an odd move to me. But I'm sure it's not, uh, not completely ludicrous. Yeah, the problem with playing H5 is it makes some of your other plans more difficult. But in the style of the King's Indian, if I can just start marching my pawns up the board, then I can get an attack. But the G5 square is white for the taking. So you have to be careful before you push your pawn to H4. White will just put the bishop on G5 to attack that pawn. So I do prefer white's position, Amon, generally speaking, in these kind of King's Indians that are closed. So I feel like Roberto has exactly what he wants. Definitely. Rook B1 looking for B4 taking the c5 square and basically saying that knight on a6 not participating at all in the game and as you mentioned each four bishop g5 is is always a always a nice way to react um if bishop g5 doesn't happen i mean you know black's always looking for ideas like knight h7 try to play f5 or maybe h4 knight h5 um if bishop g5 isn't played to maybe jump in to the f4 square but i get the feeling lawrence is kind of on both sides here like he sort of played h5, and then he's played c6. I don't really know which side of the board he's trying to play on. And that can cause confusion for Roberto. And you're right that sometimes in order to get the best attack possible, you need to threaten things on the other side of the board from where you're attacking. But this can't be good for black. Look at this pawn on d6, permanent weakness. The bishop on e2 is now a very strong piece, whereas before it was behind that c4 pawn. And now the yep. c4 square is free. So knight c4 going right after the d6 square, this looks very bad for black. Yeah, knight c4 um, also means that b4 can happen next, um, kicking that knight out. Uh, right now it looks like uh, maybe still playable, but I wouldn't go for it because the knight on c3 is loose. So b4 is a little little risky, but knight c4 uh, hitting the d6 pawn with the knight, and especially after his move queen uh, to f2, he's looking at ideas like knight c4, and then there's like knight takes e5, knight takes d6, moves to undermine that knight on c5. Yes, and what Roberto did makes sense. He didn't put the knight c4 yet, but he put his rook on c1. He's just using the queen side, and this is how the king's Indian goes except for the fact that Black's attack never got started. Right? Normally, right. your pawn's already on f5, and you're going for something on the queen side. Here, white is just first. Knight c4 now. Knight to b6 coming next. This looks so good for Roberto. It really does. Um, sometimes in these positions, you have to um, you know, give thought to move b5, which actually keeps your bishop trapped behind enemy lines. Sometimes that bishop just simply doesn't get out again. So... Um, b5 is something to consider you mentioned knight b6 makes a ton of sense um yeah at, at this point he's just taking over the c file and we talked about trading those pieces in game one this looks like a lot more in that style black is not getting a dangerous attack when you know half his attackers were just got traded off the board that's right and this bishop on g7 remains a permanent problem so don't be surprised when lawrence tries bishop f6 bishop g5 because this is the downside of the king's indian when you have a pawn e5 as they say, bad bishops stare at good pawns. Your e5 pawn is great, but your bishop on g7 is not doing very well. So I like white's position, but you do need to be careful. For example, for the mm-hmm. queen b5, trying to go all in on the queen side, if black can quickly muster some counterplay on the king side, that could spell some trouble. And I, I think bishop f6, bishop g5, it's a little slow, but if you can accomplish that, the dark squares around the white king could be in danger. Yeah, and it's so easy to you know go queen b5, and after they take on e4, go queen h4, knight f6, knight g4, e4 pawn is hanging. It's really easy for the counterplay to arrive so, so quick. So he's actually taken on f5, probably because he saw pawn takes e4 and some of those moves I was talking about. And it's not so clear how to defend that e pawn when it's all alone there. That's right. And this may look bad for white and since the d5 pawn is isolated, but you already have all the defenders you need for that pawn. And e4 is a good move because that bishop on g7, I was 
laughing at it now it looks great that's on a long diagonal and as you said knight f6 knight g4 queen h4 all these moves might happen so i would start with knight f6 and i think that induces h3 from white but that hurts the king side yeah yeah we might see like an h4 after that uh as white the the thing you like maybe about knight f6 is that it stops queen h4 so then it makes a move like queen c7 you know 10 times more attractive that you you almost force that that queen trade or you'd like to think and then you're also attacking these pawns on the queen side. I think if the queens disappear here, then uh, Roberto Molina can execute his plan of like Brook C7, you know, get this pawn and try to promote that guy. There's just one issue at the current moment that if knight of six happens and queen C7, I will trade queens and play knight G4. Your knight on B6 is on the same diagonal as your king. So there will be mm-hmm. bishop D4 check ideas in those lines. And that's actually pretty crazy because it seems like white's you know all safe and sound but at the end of the day notice when pieces are on the same diagonals each other that could backfire yeah rook f7 played so uh unfortunately lawrence was maybe not thinking tactically enough could have got away with the knight first but uh he recognizes that hey those queens come off this could be bad news for me so he wants to stop the invasion there he has given up the c8 square which has been used queen c8 check um, and if the rook gets to c7, obviously that would be uh, very, very good for white, but I'm not quite sure how that can happen. Bishop f8? But the thing about this is if you pl- played bishop f8 or knight f8, you just worsen your piece. You would love to play king h7 here. If the knight were already on f6, your king would have an escape square, although the f5 pawn would be hanging, but the rook didn't have to leave f8. I guess that's the essential point of this. Black is now tied down again, right? What, what are your next two moves for black? Like king h7 and maybe knight g6 or something like that? Right. Yeah, Actually, maybe king king h7, but it's not the fastest. No, it's not. It doesn't feel like it has that kind of force. So if I am Roberto here, I may even just think, can I push my pawn to b6 somehow? Like I play b5, move my knight, play pawn b6, maybe knight to a5, go up to your b7 pawn. It's a lot to ask for, but I mm-hmm. think that black is much slower in the approach now that you had to retreat your knight to f8. Yep. Yeah. No, that's a good point. Like as soon as the rook gets to c7, it... it it feels really good. I'm almost looking at knight a8, rook c7. Like, <laughs> as strange as it is, just to get the rook there, and then it looks like you win that pawn on b7. I kind of like knight a8. It's funky. It you know may not be objectively the best move, but it has that clear purpose, as you're saying, and you can also push the b pawn up, to establish that rook on c7, and I'm not sure how black intends to meet that. Yeah, it's just like um, the, the way that I would be afraid of black replying to that would be if this queen just sort of gets in the position in any way if it just gets down queen b2 queen a1 once the rook gets down here i'm i'm very scared uh that's why i think the evaluation bar is hovering uh very close to the middle which which means that um not that we're heading towards a draw robert but that this could definitely go either way and i think it has a lot to do with these queens being on or off the board but let's see that's a great move, queen e6. And the point is you give up your d5 pawn, which goes to e6. Black can win it, but this rook c7 idea is too powerful because if we trade, black's rook slides to e7 to win the pawn. The white knight comes to d5, and the rook has to take the pawn. The rook comes to c7. You establish dominance on the queen side. And this is very common in these kind of positions. Even at the cost of a pawn, getting the d5 square for your knight is so valuable. Yeah, and that knight is really powerful, protects f4. The f4 pawn keeps every single piece out of the e5 square. It's like this f4 pawn is, is actually dominating uh, the black pieces. You might might not even recognize that. It's hard to hard to tell the impact, but this pawn is huge right now. For sure. And look at this from knight c8, hitting the queen, hitting the d6 pawn. The queens have to come off because the rook on f7 needs a defender as well. So I really like this move, knight c8. And I guess for Lawrence, you, you don't want to trade queen to maybe queen f8, but that looks like you're on your back foot while white is making progress. And I understand what Lawrence is doing. He went h4 to go bishop h6, get this f4 pawn, and that could be protected. But wait, e7? He wants e7, rook e6, rook c7, oh, though, no. and then he's going to, like, move his king, go bishop f6, but it seems slow. The only saving grace for black is if this pawn somehow gets rolling, if it doesn't get picked up here, then it goes d5, d4. That's true. And look at look at Roberto. I'm going to start with bishop d4, because if you move your rook, I'm going to play rook c7 and pin your bishop on g7. That's probably just game, right? That looks like a great move. That looks pretty gamey. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's. 
I mean, Rook C7 is next. I think if you're Lawrence, you just have to take on E6. Your opponent doesn't have that much time left. Play like 95, 95 right? Yeah. Just, you, it's funny. We had the same exact <laughs> thought here, but it's because we've played enough, you know, speed chess, bullet chess in particular, where sometimes you just make a confusing move and play it quickly. And then your opponent doesn't have time to work through the complications, even if they are obje objectively winning. So if pawn Definitely. takes, pawn takes, now you have the F and both of the E pawns rolling and that yep. could spell trouble for white. Yeah, I, I know this is like probably very over, but it doesn't feel that winning for white yet. Like we're very close to that level, um, but I'm I'm looking at like uh, knight takes d6 ideas. Um, knight nice. takes d6 looks really strong um, taking and here. And I don't know how that end game goes, but to my eyes, you, something like getting the move king to f2 and g3 and you win with two pass pawns. Right. And actually we saw a resignation. And the reason why is, I guess he wouldn't take on g7 for a turn. He just pushes b pawn first, and right. the king Good wouldn't point. be able to stop it. So, no, that Good was point. really instructive technique by Roberto. And honestly, it's one to one, and it seems like the games have been dictated by the styles of the position. In game one, Lawrence was a great look at this. We have an Italian turned into a Duboff when he beat Sergei Karyakin with this crazy B4 move. So, this is Lawrence's style once again. Roberto wins with the white pieces in his style, like more closed position where he could mm -hmm. outplay Lawrence. So, I don't know all the theory here. I just know that Duboff beat Karyakin in this line, and that means it must be scary. Yeah. And I think, I think at the end of the day, if, if, uh, Dubov does something like this. Lawrence is going to be one of the first, uh, you know, practitioners. Uh, Lawrence loves this stuff anyway. And I know that feeling when you have a certain style and you see someone emulate it at the top level, you're like, wow, you know, this, this is unbelievable. They're showing how to do this against guys of world, uh, you know, world-class caliber. Uh, you know, I'm, I want, I want some of that. Uh, uh, I want that rush, that feeling. And it makes sense to me that Lawrence is picking up this, this opening here and i'm sure no doubt that he knows a thing or two about this it's quite possible that he knows it a bit better than his opponent which is already you know some type of advantage to speak of yes because this is a very risky variation i mean look at black's position right now the material is even it right it doesn't even look like it but black has six pawns yeah. white has wait white has seven pawns now so the now it's no longer even but you can Just take on it. You could take on d4 and restore the material equality, but this is such a wild looking position. And that's what Lawrence is counting on. It's not the objective value so much as the practical force of this when you're playing with under five minutes in the clock. Yeah. Yeah. It's more that uh, Lawrence is going to, you know, own the dark squares, so to speak. The knight on a5 is quite offside. And um, there's also that element of surprise. I don't know how surprised uh, um, Roberto is here, but let's just say there's that element of surprise that you feel like you're bringing the other player into your prep or your style, your game, rather than the other way around. So Lawrence gets to play uh, more in the style of game one and less in the style of game two, where things did not go his way. He was not able to get an attack going. Speaking of styles and surprises, Roberto played E5 on the first one of this game. I didn't even register that, but he played the Karakan in game one, and now he played E5. So are we going to see different openings pretty much every game? Is that the type of player Roberto is going to be today? Obviously, most of these titled strong players can play a variety of styles, but I just realized that we have a different opening, and that's why this kind of crazy position uh, was able to re be reached on the board. And do you think we have a different opening because he's playing different uh, styles or because he got rocked in game one <laughs> and he's like, okay, let's put that Karakan on the back burner just for a couple games, get that confidence back. Maybe he's going to look at it in the break and then bring it back. Um, the Karakan, I feel like, is not an opening where uh, you have to play the same line over and over. Like, I think he can change that up pretty easily. But um, is he going to is he going to you know, amend that before he plays it again? That might be the question. Yeah, it's a great question. And for Lawrence, he's capable of playing pretty much any opening himself. So here we continue our tactical flair. And this pawn went to g3. That's bad for the light squares. And guess what? Only black has a light square bishop. But at the same time, that knight on a5 is still stuck and out of the game. The king that's castled queenside can get under fire. When your king's mm -hmm. on the opposite side of the board, hey, uh, you know, if as my king is safe, I'm just going to go all in against your king. So right now, black needs a move. The queen's under attack. I would not take on d4. That feels pretty risky to allow some kind of you know, bishop to b2 or rook d1 first, and then yeah. bishop b2 giving you the knight for free, for free in quotes, Definitely. because I wouldn't yeah, do it yet. Uh, but I think 
you just need to move the queen and Roberto taking his time wisely. Oh, he takes. Yeah, I mean, so this move was just in time, knight c3 by Lawrence, because bishop h3 uh, was about to be in the, the position by black. Now, I'm surprised by a lot of these moves because I thought after queen d4 that we were on the same page, rook d1, and if queen takes c3, you just trade the rooks on d8 and go bishop b2, or just bishop b2 straight away. And you're picking up that free rook on g7. Now, as for this, bishop b2 doesn't look like a terrible move, but um, it does look like maybe some chances were missed. Rook d1 looks really active and quite forcing. Yeah, this is the difference between seeing tactics generally and specifically. Lawrence understood that there's a problem for Black taking this pawn on d4. He saw his bishop going to b2. Instead of sitting behind a pawn, it now has a, yeah. the length of diagonal. So he recognized that queen takes d4, he had something. He just didn't do the precise move order. And now look what Roberto does. Say, hey, queen d3, don't mind trading queens. If you take me, I have a pass pawn. The c4 square is vacated for my, my knight. And if you try to keep the queens on the board, where is your queen going? Like, are you really going to give me control of your light square as your king is not very safe? And maybe, right. in fact, black can play a move like queen to c or d2 and go after this bishop on b2 and the knight on c3. So there's too much going on here, I believe, for white to keep the queens on the board. And that's why we just saw rook to d1. Yeah, and I, I was almost wondering about queen d3 because I thought queen d2 maybe was more forcing to really get those uh, queens off the board, hitting the queen and the bishop. Um, the reason that that tactic uh, was missed and it's actually kind of a big deal is that the rook on g7 it wasn't coordinated with the rook on d8. Anytime you can make a, an exchange of rooks and the king has to like take and come towards the center, that always feels like a good sign. So I think uh, Roberto has emerged with a great position. Uh, Lawrence is not going to be happy playing that type of opening and then having to just trade queens into an endgame where he's actually just one pawn down. And he could take on a5, which would leave black with one of the ugliest pawn structures I've ever seen, with double isolated a pawns, double isolated c pawns. But you have a pass pawn in c4, and your rook, even though it was a problem piece in g7 before, that rook can even slide up via g5 or something like that. So I do like black's chances here. This is the type of position Roberto could only have dreamed of, considering how wild the game was before this. But as you said, Mon, he's up a pawn. And if you start yeah. trading pieces, that extra pawn will make itself felt. Yeah, and you know if this uh, knight reroutes to, to d6, I think that that would be quite good. Is he going here and then taking and going rook c1? That's actually what I thought he was going to do. Okay, but I like rook g5 here. I'll give you the e6 pawn to take your b5 pawn. Like I, That one's hanging. And if you play a4 to defend, now my knight finally has an active free square to go to with the b3 square. So he plays rook d8 instead. I guess he's just trying to go rook d3 and... Get he a just wants the moving. pawn to go. But can you just take and go rook e3? I think so, yes. Um, because one thing to not underestimate <laughs> at all is a bishop against a knight, if white just has one pass pawn over here, it might compensate for, like, oh, the entire queen side. Right. And oh, so, I, by the way, I, I really like that knight b7 move because he did not want to allow the bishop to take at that point as he is yeah. two pawns down on the king side. And now take on b5. You can't take yeah. on c4 because rook d1 check, rook c1, pinning the bishop. And I think he yeah, overlooked it. Really I, I, could t I could tell he had overlooked it just by the way he was playing. But now he has officially overlooked it. And rook d1, rook c1 just wins a piece. Yeah. And it's funny because Roberto oh, almost looked like he overlooked it. But now it's very clear on the webcam yes. that Lawrence overlooked that. Oh, he was just distraught. He was, you know, beside himself there. And now Roberto is about to pick up his second game in a row. And Lawrence will have to go back to the drawing board because this opening did not go the way he wanted it to. Well, actually, it kind of did. But then he misstepped by playing Bishop B2. So he, he had the craziness that he was desiring, but he didn't convert it that well. Well, the nice thing about his position is that you just play the pawns. You don't calculate. You know, you're, you're pissed off. You, you blundered a piece. Hey, at least take some solace in just pushing these pawns blindly. You know, Aman, it's probably too early to think match strategy, but I know Roberto is a fantastic bullet player. I would consider resigning already if I were Lawrence. I mean, not, not in this particular game, but generally speaking, if you lose a piece, sometimes you just resign so you get more games in. But there are these three pawns here on the king side for white. So uh, Lawrence should play this particular game out. I just was thinking about it in terms of the overall match picture because actually white's pawns are quicker right now. And it's possible that this blunder turns into 40 <laughs> because H6, how do you stop the pawns? Because you have G4 to stop the rook. <laughs> like that white's winning now according to the engine I, rook g7 i mean 
basically push the pawn and decide about the rook later. Yes. That's that's the way I'm, I'm thinking about it. And you could have played the pawn to h7, you know, rook h8 check, pawn h7. So this is just wild. And now there may only be like one or two ways for Roberts to hold. I think knight f5 is rook g5 happening. And how do you defend this knight, right? If you play mm -hmm. rook c5, you walked into a pin. So why can't you even start pushing the h pawn some more? This is, wow, this is turning real fast. So knight h6, maybe just run around with your knight? <laughs> yeah, I guess the, well. Oh, knight e3 check. If you move the king and then go g4, mm -hmm. that feels pretty logical. There's going to be a rook check, but 17 seconds for Roberto. I think we can <laughs> easily see Lawrence winning this game. Which is just absolutely crazy. But if he goes h6 now, rook c6, you have to... I thought you'd play rook c6 and just take the pawn directly because the problem with this line is you will win the h6 pawn, but you're losing oh, your yeah, a5 why? pawn. Why is this better? Yeah, you lost a, a very important tempo because you're dropping this pawn on a5. I would have actually gone to g4 with the king. I know it looked like counterintuitive. King g2 hits the rook, but king g4 is just like better place for the end game. White should probably win this. Like, <laughs> I feel pretty good about Lawrence's position here. Wow, what a turnaround this game has seen. But king d6 trying to go c5. Look at Roberto very smartly. He's saying, I just need to push my pawns. Don't play it now because the rooks get traded. Rook b8, yep. great move. His technique at this point in time is perfect. C5, C4, keep those pawns going. And unfortunately for white, you're not in time with your past pawns. And what a tale this has been, Amon, where at first you blunder a piece, then your pawns are really fast. Now all of a sudden black is down a pawn, but his pawns are faster. Weird yep. stuff. And I like this from Lawrence. I think the goal is to just get your king in. Um, ASAP, like king d4, rook c6 ideas. Um, just chase these guys down and then connect your own pawns. Right, but b3 is happening. That rook is behind the past pawn. So you have to be very careful that you don't just allow this pawn to go promote for black. This that's is point. so bizarre. Yeah, it's b3 or c3. He has a choice. And that's where it becomes a problem. You expect c3 and then b3 happens. But this is why Lawrence dropped his rook back. And now, how do you go? Okay, two seconds. You got to move. Roberto, go. Oh. oh, my gosh. And oh, oh, no, we lost some time. Oh my goodness, the plus one is just just not enough. And Look at Lawrence. Lawrence is over the moon. Look at that reaction. He blundered a full piece, like the fullest piece you could blunder. Wow, that was unbelievable. And Lawrence, you could see how much he's putting into this match. At first, he was devastated that he blundered. Then he calmed himself down. And he realized something that even I wasn't realizing. Hey, wait a second. My pawns are fast. I still have a chance here. And yeah. he actually wins that game. And for Roberto, where did all his time go? Uh, well, it went into winning a piece and then uh, not only overthinking, but probably miscalculating and, and totally missing the right idea, defensive idea to stop those pawns. Because there's always a balance between getting your pawns going and at some point maybe using the knight to sacrifice for an advanced white pawn, but what he ended up doing was was like the worst of both worlds. He didn't get his pawn going quick enough. He lost one of his queenside pawns, and he didn't really stop the the h pawn without losing his piece. So uh, just a disaster game, and that's how you untilt. I mean, Lawrence was ready to throw in the towel, and all of a sudden he's you know sitting up in his chair and fist bumping at the end. Yeah, and now he's playing the Benoni where his knight on c7 looks absolutely amazing. That is sarcasm. That knight does not look very good, but this is a typical plan. Can you get rook b8? Can you play b5? I personally am not a big believer in the Benoni. I think it just gives white a very healthy position, but there are times you play b5 or play f5, so it is in Lawrence's style. And for me, I just, I don't personally like it, but it is an acceptable opening. We can use the term acceptable. That's acceptable. <laughs> Yeah, right. It's, it's, it's fine. You know, it, it has its merits. And uh, well, Rook B8, I think his intentions are quite clear. Yep. You want to play B5. And what we see is a position where Lawrence is going to have a bit better control of the dark squares just because, um, you know, the light square bishop has traded for the knight on F3 um, at some point in this game. And, uh, you know, Black's going to go like knight d7, wants to have the e5 square. b5, uh, at the moment, Roberto's saying, look, you know, give me the a file and get my rook down to a7. Um, at the moment, I'm not sure Lawrence wants to open the position, but that is what he wants to do in general. And he's going to go b5. Right? If there's any player who wants to play aggressively, it is Lawrence Trent. He goes b5, which is a good decision. And look at this. This e4 pawn looks strong, but it can quickly get in trouble. So that's why Roberto put his knight to d1 knight to f2 and he's keeping everything 
I don't want to say safe and sound, but for now it's a pretty compact situation. Yeah, I love knight b5. I think knight d7, some sort of knight d4, um, taking over some dark squares in the middle of the board makes a lot of sense. Although this pawn on e4 is defended, knight f2, bishop f3, it actually can't really advance that easily unless you want, well, I was going to say, unless you want to make things completely murky and tactical. But not only does that play into the style of number one, Lawrence Trent, but number two, the Benoni as an opening is ready for these types of skirmishes in the middle. Yeah, although there is a bishop pair for white. So if the position opens up, those bishops can thrive. And look at this, bishop f4, winning one of the rooks. But look at Lawrence. I don't care about that rook. Look <laughs> at my dark care. square bishop. You take me on e5, I take back. But this is an important lesson right now. Do, I was going to say, I don't think you should take. That mm -hmm. rook couldn't move anywhere. If you move that rook, you lose the other rook. So I think that right. Roberto had one move to use there. And by taking on e5, he helped Lawrence just say, I'm, I'm going to be in this material deficit regardless, but I now have the activity because I get to strike. And it looked like he could have used the knight, knight d3, knight g4, put more pressure on that rook. And if you could take the rook with the knight, then I think Lawrence's sacrifice is simply not good. That's true. And, and right now it's pretty double-edged. I would say that when I yep. look at this, you have a rook for a knight and one pawn, but also this opposite colored bishop dynamic. And don't take on c5 now because bishop d4 check. But just in general, the black controls the dark squares. White doesn't really control the light squares because the knight, an excellent blockading piece, says your d pawn's not going anywhere. Your best move for white would be bishop takes pawn on d5. You can't do that. Mm -hmm. So the bishop on f3 doesn't really have anything to boast about. Yeah, and there's an interesting choice there. Queen takes d6, sort of speaks to getting that knight into d4, but knight d6, the best blockader in chess, supports the c-pawn push that rook can get behind and that pawn just basically sits on c3 defended by the bishop uh I, I love the confidence that lawrence is playing with in this game he didn't bat an eye when he lost that exchange um uh, or I, I don't even want to say lost that exchange when he gave up that exchange because that's just so thematic it's exactly the way you want to play in this opening plus uh, if i had to take a position i'm taking black here Oh, me too. And I think that Lawrence needs to be a bit careful because you do want to push this pawn to C3, but you don't want to just use all of your attention over there, right? If you just get tunnel vision, that could be a problem. But I like his move queen F6. He's using his queen and his bishop. He is a much better situation. This bishop on F3, it's not a good piece. And there's nowhere for it to go. Like if I said, hey, yeah. Amon, throw the bishop somewhere, you'd say, okay, I'll go to C6. That looks good. Yeah. Good luck not getting there, right? <laughs> right? And it's not that much better, but it, you, know, you can't even get there. So that's the biggest problem in white's position is you can't use your extra material well. And in fact, yeah. black with the C pawn, as you pointed out, it's just uh, roaming down the board. Yeah, this and it needs to be said, like even move like queen d4, if the queens get traded, it's not like Roberto's position gets that much better. It might not help at all. Like end games, and he plays queen d4, like he even offers the exchange. Takes, takes rook d2, runs into bishop e3. So I think he's just going to go to e2. But it's just an example of like, you can trade queens while being quote unquote down material because of how strong the pieces on the board are uh, in Black's position. Absolutely. And when you are ahead material, like Roberto is by points, you want to think about how to give some of it back. That should be in the back of your mind. So if Roberto can like play uh, some kind of like rook takes c4 and give up his rook for that knight and that pawn, you would want to do that. It relieves the rest of your position. So I like how Roberto's handling this the last couple of moves, but he's still in trouble. Yeah, yeah, rook a8 played. Um, just thinking about rook a2, like rook a2, <laughs> take on b2, got two pieces there. As soon as you get that b pawn, by the way, the <laughs> floodgates open. Like those two pawns might even be worth sacking a piece just to get that pawn, depending on the position. I was thinking about that as well. Like, can I play some kind of bishop takes b2 and give up my piece? Of course, Lawrence shouldn't do that. And yeah. by the way, both players have a lot of time. When I'm looking yeah. at this position, I would expect them to be down to like 30 seconds, but they are moving very quickly and they're both playing well in this game. So if you play rook a2, I'm going to probably have to do something like rook to b1. And how does black proceed from there is going to be an important question. And the thing with rook d2, like if you just look at white's last, you know, almost 10 moves, what is he doing? He's not doing anything proactive. It's all reactive. And it just means that Lawrence sort of has a free hand. Uh, in this game, he can choose, do I want to push the tempo now? Do I want to you know, change the pawn structure a bit? Do I want to get my king in the middle? Um, it seems like Lawrence can just decide how he wants to play this game. Um, does he want to push the tempo or play this game a little bit longer, get the clocks lower? I don't see any active plans that Roberto has. He's sort of just shuffling and, and defending. Yeah, I think the one move I would consider here for 
Roberto's bishop e4 just to kick that rook out of b1. The knight does not want to take on e4. So at least I kick your rook away. And then I don't have a plan exactly, but I have, I have a one move threat. I can be happy about that. Yeah, that's something. That's something. It looks like, you know, maybe pointing towards g4s of the world uh, with king h3, although I don't think that's that's really what you want to do here. No, and Lawrence, uh, for, on his end, he needs to find the correct path for it. Will it be c3? Will it be b3? I like the look of b3. You cement that pawn on b2, and maybe you can yeah. go attack it. But the problem with playing b3 is now both of your pawns are on light squares. And it's not like the bishop will go win those pawns, but you have to be careful about doing some of that because when you push the b pawn, c3 becomes a bit less powerful in many of the variations. So instead... Lawrence brings his rook to e1, the bishop to g2. Roberto is kind of aimlessly moving around, but at least he's doing it quickly because exactly. Lawrence is now down, what, 40 seconds on the clock? Yep, he's down 40 seconds. Uh, what I was maybe thinking for Lawrence is, you know, almost put the pieces back where they just came from, try bishop e5, f6, and then like some long king walk up to like c5 or even to like b5, a4, b3. Um, basically, I feel like this king needs to participate. I agree with you. And Lawrence is spoiled for choice, which is why he's spending so much time looking at him. He is upset. He's frustrated because he knows his position is better. Roberto knows the same, but he's like, what do I do? He trades rooks and that simplifies things. And sometimes that will allow your plan of a king march into the center and all that good right. stuff. But that also means that you may not have enough rich material remaining to press for a win. Yeah. And, and the good thing at the moment is the rook is stuck to that b pawn as soon as this rook you know gets free and can maybe approach the pawns from behind that's a whole different game um i don't know whether i love or hate the decision from lawrence right now because you know f6 you know is a little bit harder to do to run that king the g pawn would be weak from the bishop and right now bishop e2 is the idea to to try to hit that to c4 pawn but i think that this is still good for for lawrence i, I don't hate his decision yeah it still looks pleasant for black but Again, it, does he have enough material remaining? So B3, I like that move now, as white was going to play bishop E2 next, and now the rook has to move away, and mm -hmm. black will play king F6. I don't quite see where a finishing touch will happen, but C3 will be a consideration in the near future, and then put my pawn on B2, and just keep you tied down. So that's what Lawrence, I think, is going for. He does so, and I'm not sure it's enough, though. Yeah, I'm not sure it's enough. I, I think with that plus one and the fact that you can just throw that pawn on b2 and have it protected it should be at the very least solid but what you're worried about is white you know putting his bishop on c2 covering that and then the rook suddenly is free to play the rook can just do things and <laughs> you don't know what those are you know how dangerous they're going to be but for example the rook's cutting the king off and if that pawn ever starts to, to move up the board it's just curtains for black that's right. And the great thing about opposite color bishops here is that you put a pawn on b2, that pawn can't be attacked. The terrible thing is that the b1 square is a light square. So as we're discussing here that you put a bishop on b1, your bishop protects your pawn, but can't actually kick that blockading piece out. So uh, Roberto's hanging on by a thread here. He's really just he barely holding things together. But look at the clock. It is about to be even on time. That's good news for Lawrence because his position is better. And it's much harder to defend this as white than it is to push with black. Yeah, you can just shuffle. I mean, pawn there, knight to a3, just as a simple uh, way to threaten b1. Love the way that Lawrence has played this game. Like, start to finish, maybe it wasn't perfect, but that's what chess is. You're not going to know the exact winning plan. Lawrence was poking and prodding around with his rook, with his pieces. He's going to get this pawn to b2, and uh, I think he's done a fantastic job. Let's see if he can convert. Yeah, I don't like defending the B1 score with the rook, even though he's keeping his D5 pawn. There could be, yeah, I was about to say Bishop D2, next move Bishop C1. And if the rook has to go to B1, that rook is stuck there. This reminds me of Niels Grandelius against That's Jordan Van Forest. When the rook gets caught like that, it's just game. Knight C4, Knight D2, and that's That, that. is game over. Um, so as, as you just pointed out, I mean, that once the knight comes in, it's, okay, Knight C4, Knight A3. Knight e4, knight c3, lots of ways to do it. Can't even play king e2. Knight d2 is a fork and oh. good game. Oh, that, that's painful. And what a win by Lawrence Trent. I mean, he really wow. played a great start to this match with the exception of game two, right? Game two was not friendly to him. And that's what Roberto needs to do. We are taking you know, our halftime break here. But Aman, what advice would you give to Roberto to try to come back in this match? It's still pretty close. 
Yeah, very very close match, uh, three to one. He obviously had that uh, game that slipped away from him. So in his head, it probably feels, in terms of how they've played, more like a two two match because he just slipped that game away where he was up a piece. So I don't think Roberto should panic at all. He might go and check that Karo Khan because we know that he does love that opening. So I would say just relax. Um, you you know you're the stronger paper. Uh, player on paper rather and I don't think that he needs to panic at all Lawrence is playing great chess but if Roberto steps his game up that this match is going to be tied uh, again in no time for sure and speaking of relaxing all you relax take a brief break we will be back in just a few minutes for more of this match between Roberto Molina and Lawrence Tread.
and we return with more action from this fascinating battle between two of the strongest IMs we got. And Aman, it has been so great thus far. Lawrence thriving in those tactical positions, but also showing some classy endgame technique in that fourth game we just saw. Yeah, I got to give a lot of credit to, to Lawrence, not only in this match so far, because we've seen so many different styles from him, um, Robert. Like, I, I feel like right off uh, the bat in game one, we saw his aggressive, hey, take my pawn, uh, poison pawn variation. I'm just going to storm the king style and executed very well. Then in uh, his other win, we saw uh, him blunder a piece and make a comeback, stay in the game. He lost his confidence and he got it right back, pushing those pawns, claiming a, a win somehow at the end of that. And then we see this last game where it start to finish, you know, he sacks the exchange, plays a beautiful positional controlled game and executes in the end game. It's like, oh, we're seeing everything from Lawrence Trent right now. We certainly are. And he's been nervous. We saw his reaction when he blundered that piece. But nerves are a good thing. Alexander Grishuk said this. He said, you know, nerves are good. It means I care. And so you like to see when players are showing their emotion, but still controlled after that fact. So Lawrence, three to one lead thus far. For Roberto, I feel like he needs to play, of course, like he did in the second game. But you reminded me of the fact that he was of a piece. So he had that chance to be level at this point. And it's that close of a match. Right. Yeah. So that, that's the thing is that uh, Roberto knows he he's basically played well enough to earn himself at least two wins in this match so far. So he can he can uh, tell himself that at all times. What we have here is uh, Lawrence actually changing it up. Right. He played Bishop B5 went for the Rui Lopez instead of Bishop C4 from uh, last game. We we're wondering if he was maybe going to look at that line. And I wonder if he did look at it during the break where you get a couple minutes like, well, that didn't really pan out. Roberto knew what he was doing. Let's go for something that's a bit more closed in nature. But speaking, you know, as we have been about styles, this would seem, at least on a high level, thought that it's good for Roberto to get into these positions. Yeah, I, I wonder um, if Lawrence, because of the fact that he uh, does a lot of commentary, on uh, high level matches like the world championship. I wonder if he sees openings like this in those matches, a world championship match candidates and starts to implement them a bit more into his own chess because it's almost like this main, main, main line, Rui Lopez is one of the last things I'd expect to see Lawrence Trent playing. Yeah, especially in the blitz game, it's kind of odd, but we see this in the speed chess championship when you have the Maxime Vachir Lagraves of the world playing, but this is yeah. really mainline stuff. But I do like Lawrence's position. This knight on b7 is really not happy. Where is it going from there? And Roberto says, yeah, I'm just going to play quickly. I'll take on e7, please. Queen takes e7. You're freeing mm -hmm. up the board for me. And I want to remind everybody that c4 square is looking awfully juicy for a black knight. When you have pawns two squares away from one another, look at the square in between. That c4 square is blacks for the taking at a later point. Yeah, and I think that explains uh, the move knight e3 perfectly. I don't even need to touch on that because that watches over that square. We might even just see c4 right now in the position. It looks very reasonable. I know it looks funny. All four pawns up there on the fourth rank, but c4 looks uh, like a pretty good move. And one of the reasons I wanted to do that, Robert, before bishop b2 was I wanted to you know, do the cheeky rook swing, get the rook into the center, rook d2, rook e2, rook c2 before playing bishop b2. That makes a lot of sense because what is that rook doing? Look, he just went bishop a1, probably because of what you were saying. And I think black should have went for a strike with a5 because now after c4, a5 doesn't look nearly as appealing. There's a lot of tension right. in the center. That rook, as you just pointed out, Amon, that can go to c2 now because in line with the queen. It can go to d2 to line up along that d5, which is bound to open up. Or it can even go to e2 if you need to defend that pawn. So you're right. I like white's position now. Lawrence is handling this well. And Roberto, he just feels like he's floundering a bit. He doesn't have a concrete plan. And now the position is about to open up. And that bishop on a1, watch out for that piece. Wow. Yeah, that's going to be very strong. The only thing about Lawrence's position is he's kind of lost a move, like bishop b2, bishop a1. And in a lot of cases, you actually want your bishop to be on b2 just because it controls a few more squares. So um, if the rook was already in the center somewhere and bishop on b2, I think it'd be a little bit better. But hey, you can't have everything. This knight on b7, as you mentioned, is still out of the game. You know, it almost wants to go to d8 and e6 just to play, just to have some scope. But uh, e4 pawn taken and 
All I can say is that bishop on a1, we mentioned how dominant it's going to be. Taking on e4 looks greedy, and it doesn't look like he has the position to justify, uh, you know, taking the time uh, to take that pawn. I already see a ton of different ideas for why queen c2 hits the rook. Now you're throwing c takes b5 when the c pawn for black cannot recapture. The queen is hanging down the file. So after c b5, the c6 pawn will be white. And that's an important pawn because, yes, black stole a central pawn, but I'm splitting your pawns on the queen side if I take on c6. But I can also play knight d5, just continue pushing forward here. He takes on c6, which is good, right? This is a great position for white, but he could have Fantastic. been tactical with knight to d5. Yeah, it could have just combined them, knight d5 and then queen c6, and then both knights get in there. Like, this knight on b7 is still just not participating at all. No, and it may have to go to d8 to just trade off or something like that, but look at this. Roberto gains a tempo. Essentially, white could have had the same queenless position with a knight on d5, but black right. gets the knight first, and now black can play d5, and that knight on yep. b7 may come to d6 and into the c4 square that we talked about so long ago. And it's funny how that one little extra tactic, it's like the sprinkle that Robert's putting on, on top of the uh, the cup cake because queen takes c6 is a great move, but knight d5 taking advantage of the pin would have stopped knight b6, would have stopped d5, would have stopped knight d6, and black's whole activation plan to get back in this game, it looks like it's it's just a product of not putting that, that little knight d5 move in. It, it seems to be making all the difference. It certainly does. And black is now freeing up the board for the bishop on f8, the knight on b7. And it, as is typical in the Rolo Lopez, if your knight is stuck on b7, your position often is very terrible. Anatoly Karpov could teach everybody a thing or three about that. And right now, Lawrence plays g3. He's not happy to make that move. Knight d6, knight c4. Black's pieces are just going into the board here, it's like flying freely. Yeah. I, I mean, the. It looks like rook d1 is also an idea to, to get that pawn. Knight c4, is he trying to say, look, take that pawn, I take on a3, and, and then the knight on b7 is already got that d6 square. It just looks like it's getting closer and closer to it's just an equal position. Yeah, I agree. And I do wonder why he left his knight on b7. He was going for like the quick pounce of like knight c4, I'm going to threaten the a3 pawn. But the knight on b7 is still a problematic piece. And even if it is level, I feel like Game was turning in Black's favor. So bringing that knight out from the wayside into the action could have been beneficial for Black, not just to equalize, but even to play for more. Yeah, I, I like the idea of moving on knight uh, d6, because then if rook d1, knight c4 from the d file, and if knight takes d5, there's always this rook e1 trick to win the piece on d5. So it's kind of a nice way to get the c4 square, but not let white execute maybe the, the plan that he's going for, uh, which is just to probably uh, say, look, I see the, the the black pieces coming into the game. Let's just equalize things and let, not let this get out of hand. And Lawrence spent some time, quickly responds with rook a2. That rook can come to a7 at some point. I don't think I would do it just yet, but that's the thing. Knight c3 hits the rook on e4, the pawn on b5, but then the pawn yeah. on b4 is hanging in return because that knight, oh, actually there's knight c6 too. Both of them are protected. So maybe you can play knight c3 and just go after the b5 pawn. It's funny. There's so many like knight c7, uh, knight a7, knight c3, knight d4. There's so many ways to hit that b pawn. Uh, it would almost be a shame at this point if he didn't manage to get his hands on it. Um, it does look like the most likely scenario, though, is both sides win the, the respective b pawns. And, you know, from there, it just sort of equalizes. But the time advantage that Roberto has could be maybe the, well, so far, that's the biggest difference in the position. Both sides active pieces all around. Look at the time, though, a minute and a half plus. Yeah, and there's something long-term that I believe Lawrence is struggling with. The bishop on a1 looks beautiful on the board's longest diagonal, but there's a pawn on b4 that's on a dark square. So if the knights come off the board, all four of them, black's bishop can attack white's pawn, and then white's pawn has to resort to defense. So that's something to look for if you're Roberto and you're trying to figure out, hey, can I actually try to squeeze this equal position into a win? Rookie two is a yeah. great start, of course. That's an active move. But I'm just thinking about what pieces I want to trade. And if the knights come off, White is the one who's stuck with a worse pawn. Yep, and rook e2 uh, threatens ideas like rook d2. Hey, move your knight. Well, you're walking into knight e3 fork using that pin on the f pawn. And, you know, just rook d2, other rook down to e2. Feels like Roberto is making easy, fast moves. And look at that time tick down for Lawrence. He comes up with h4. I think we're slowly seeing this tick, 
you know, in, in Black's favor here as he plays h5. So now he has an escape square for the king. Right. And if you toss an hour on each player's clock, it still is a difficult position to figure out. But you see Lawrence in 18 seconds. He is two minutes behind on the clock. So if I'm Roberto, I'm just keeping things a bit sharp. Knight f5 threatens 93 check. And yeah. it's not about going for one move tactics. It's just putting your opponent in as difficult a spot as possible. That could be with a simple move, but sometimes you have to be aggressive. Knight e4 hits the f2 pawn. How do you even defend that? Bishop d4. Oh. Um comes yeah. to mind because the bishop on a1 is just not a good piece anyway as you pointed out so at least we can centralize that the rook d8 move is not possible um, those knights actually do control a fair few amount of squares rook c8 to hit the knight just blunders everything away with 97 check now good call 97 check is something that white can rely on and i would probably play my knight from c4 to d6 and over to f5 and that's mainly because of the time situation but that bishop on d4 is defending f2 if i can somehow get that piece off the board then the white king and in particular pawn f2 get in danger so i think knight c to d6 makes some sense but maybe i'm overlooking some kind of counter for white but 10 seconds that's what i'm really looking at Exactly. Um, as white, like as Lawrence, I am moving that king sometime soon. You know, king f1, king g1. I just have to get out of the oh! way. Oh, the, six rook, blade. the rooks are forked. The rooks are forked. He, Wait, he, there's no way out of this. Oh my he, goodness. he walked right into a fork. <laughs> <laughs> well, he thought he was. It's one of those things you think you're hitting the knight, and Oh my goodness, he's totally he's totally botched this one. Again, we see Roberto right at the end of the game when, when it seems like it's trending in his favor. He's messing things up. And he can't even play g6 here to protect the h5 pawn because rook a8, rook h8, checkmate. That bishop on oh d4, it's been the best piece. It thrives right now. So R Roberto is down a rook for a knight and one pawn. It's very confusing. Lawrence has 6.5 seconds left. So I would probably play rook d6 here, pin that bishop, and then Lawrence has to figure out, wait, do I need to protect my rook on d1 or can exactly. I just leave this here? What do I do? And he plays rook to a1, and Love that's that a good move. move. Very, very good move and a practical choice at that. Love that. By uh, by Lawrence, just the 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 understanding that oh he hung a piece he hung a piece protect that my goodness yeah that's what I happens can't when you... I can't get around complimenting people <laughs> I'm gonna stop that you know as soon as you went to compliment him he drops the piece but the position was complicated look at how many minor pieces were concentrated in a very few amount of squares so rook a7 yeah. I like that you're trying to take f7 you are down material it's two pieces against a rook knight of four check where's that king going rook king b7 Okay, king, if you go king e6, knight of four back. King e6, I take the g7 pawn as well. Oh, wow, yeah, that's even worse. So you have to go back to g6, I guess. I think he's got his, like, pseudo draw here, unless he wants to give the f7 pawn and really go for it. Maybe he's not rook, happy. Maybe rook takes f4. Just sacrifice your rook. Bishop c3, wow. pawn b4. There he goes. That's the energy. There he goes. I don't like f6, oh, though. Whoa, rook b7 was needed there. Yes. Oh, rook takes d2. Oh, my gosh, blunders galore here. Oh, that's what oh, wait, what? Whoa, whoa. what? No, that can't be good. This is just the nervousness, the time trouble. Yeah. Black might win this game still. Like Black's king could try to kick that rook out of there, but look at Lawrence in time to bring his king around. Oh my gosh. Just in time. And rook well, c4? Oh, not f3. Get king g3. Uh oh, okay. there goes the g6 pawn. This is and their king's cut off as well. Yeah, this king isn't d3. good. This oh. isn't good. King up the board, king e3. I would cut that king off king d3. I like that. And you can't play C2 too soon. Now you were threatening C2, but because the pawn's promotion so was about winning this? Rook G6 is needed, maybe? Uh, but the pawn's going to F4. No, this looks Ooh. like it should be a draw. If black establishes that pawn on the dark square and the bishop defends both, it feels like we're heading towards a draw. But this game can last forever. Mm -hmm. He's going to build up some time, which is absolutely the way to do things. Mm -hmm. um, but the question really is, after he has all that time, what can he do with it? And I'm not sure that I know what yeah. the answer is. He has time, but his pieces don't have freedom here. So, like, he's just stuck. Like, he, he can't, can't go over to the king side because the c pawn is free. Otherwise, the rook has to go defend, and a draw by repetition makes sense. And I don't, I don't think in this particular position at the end that either player is going to be too upset with that result. But I think both players should be upset with that result in general. <laughs> yes. Both players had had opportunities to win that game at various points, and it, it wasn't just like they each had one chance. No, they each had multiple chances. That's very true. And look at Lawrence; he's playing b6, bishop b7. You know, he's trying to 
hit at white center, but this is already a Roberto opening. They have the pawn triangle. Now I push the pawn to e4. Very solid here. So I like this for Roberto compared to the Benoni. Even if I personally don't like the Benoni, I think that it suits Lawrence and Roberto struggled with it a bit. Yep. And there's no no shame in admitting that, especially in a match. You don't have to don't have to put any uh, any ego there. Just play the openings that that seem to be benefiting you. Um, it doesn't matter their reputation. Knight h5 and Lawrence is he's got that bishop that never looks too great against uh, you know pawn chain like that. And the question is always, am I going to reroute that bishop or am I going to leave it there pressuring that pawn? Just go for f5 and then put the pressure on the d pawn and the e4 pawn to loosen up that pawn chain. Right, this is thematic, and you would prefer that your piece had a little bit more space for black, but that's why the move f5 is so powerful. You're trying to crash through in the center. You're trying to give your pieces more space. One of the knights, maybe even the d knight, comes over to f6. But either way, Roberto is struggling to come up with a move. Uh, he has plenty of time. The game has just started. But Amon, when I look at this position, I think, okay, do I want to take on f5? But then g takes f5. There could be e4. Maybe I'm walking into a pawn storm. That might not be so good. But if I leave the tension in the center, at some point, is black just going to collapse it with f takes e and knight to f6 and the d5 pawn is weak? I don't really want to play pawn to c4, but that is what he just chose. I wanted the c4 square for my knight. That's really the essence of it. Yeah, and I think f4 makes, makes a lot of sense here. Now, in, in a position like this, I'm a little bit more concerned about stuff like taking on f5, like knight h4, um, and putting pressure on f5, and also, of course, queen uncovering the attack on the h5 knight. So knight f1 played. f4 still looks good, especially if the knight were not on d7. f4 would look great. So uh, Lawrence takes and goes knight f6, but the bishop on e4 isn't that important of a piece. You can retreat it, of course, uh, but, you know, it, it's weird because you have sort of a fianchetto pawn structure but i feel like you want to just blockade the square so like knight d2 if it mm -hmm. didn't block your bishop would have been a good move just so you can keep blocking that e4 square a knight f3 to d2 that was so i wouldn't walk in pins and bishop g4 seems annoying like I, that's a nasty pin there's there's no h3 to kick it out bishop g4 seems like a great start especially with that rook on on f8 um that's that looks good but the question is after knight e3 Bishop takes, queen takes. You, you're looking at that rook bearing down on the queen on C uh, on f3, but there's not really any good squares to put your knight. Yeah, it's so annoying when that happens. Like, what? I just lined everything up perfectly, and yet yeah. I can't take advantage of it. And that, that's a really good point. And you also don't want to allow white to blockade the e4 square. If that knight on f3 just could go diagonally for a turn to go to e4, now your bishop on g7 is stuck. That doesn't look great. So e4 is thematic. I'm not sure if it's good because you drop a pawn by making the e4 but that's that's the kind of thing i'm looking at just to free up black's pieces right and knight g4 a totally different uh approach but the exact same goal which is basically put pressure on f2 that's what e4 was all about as well e4 maybe knight g4 was to follow now we see knight g4 first and the idea of like maybe queen f6 next um sometimes there's even sacrifices on f2 followed by like bishop g4 things could get really really spicy here um, you know, pawn sacks and peace sacks galore in, in the position here. So I think that this is just getting towards a position that Lawrence is, is turning into a tactical struggle. Yeah, I would play bishop g5 for white and then play knight f1 to d2 and try as best as I can to get my knight to e4 because I know if my knight gets to e4, f2 is safer. I'm also attacking yeah. this d6 pawn. So that's what I'd be looking for if I were Roberto. And it's about even on the clock, both sides playing deliberately, clear plans. I like the way this game has gone for black, but I'm worried about the long term, the strategic risk that is inherent to this kind of position. And it's that pawn on d6, the backward pawn, and a knight on e4 blockades the center and threatens it. Yeah, knight on e4, as you just brought up, is a, is a great piece. Um, that just controls everything. So I just, I like the flow of your bishop g5 knight f1 to d2. And then if the bishop gets attacked, it can always come back to e3 and white's not that concerned about losing that bishop. You know, go ahead and take me. I might even play pawn takes on e3. Slide the pieces over to the open f file. And remember, trades here are not only good for the position, but they're good for Roberto as a player. He seems to be doing well when he can take things to an end game, more positional struggle, and, and really take it to Lawrence. Yeah, and that's why I think Lawrence, it's in his style to play a move like e5 to e4 at some point. 
even if it gives up a pawn, the bishop slicing through the board from g7, that could be really helpful to the attacking chances. And you have to time it well. You can't just do it and say, hey, it looks good. No, it has to really work. But yeah. I, I think that Roberto, he needs to move because he plays knight f... What? Rook f takes up two? Oh my god, that's a, that's like... Didn't he think for like two minutes on that move? And Lawrence is like sitting back in his chair like, did he just do what I thought he just did? He has no idea what's going on. And look at Roberto's face. He hasn't flinched, but... Well, that's because Lawrence could be looking at the camera, you know? <laughs> he can't, can't let your opponent know that you just completely blundered. The only intention of knight g4? I will say, and maybe this is just trying to justify a big blunder, is that if you can play knight e4 and you don't get checkmated, the knight e4 is really powerful and sometimes is worth the cost of a pawn. You mentioned how with the f-file open, you can slide your pieces to the f-file. That still holds true. Like white's next move, the rook goes back to f7, could be knight to e3, will trade knights. You know, all of a sudden white's pieces are doing better, so it costs you material, but you feel like you have a healthier position remaining. It, it still is a pawn, though. So, so let me get this straight, Robert. You're saying that <laughs> Roberto Molina found a way to open the F file without trading pieces. Do I hear you right? I, I'm just <laughs> saying that I'm just trying to justify it. It was a blunder. Like it is, I, I yes, the rook on F8 and the 9G4 were clearly hitting this pawn F2. So I, I'm trying my best here, Amon. I'm trying my best. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm not going to hate on that knight on E4. That's exactly where I wanted it. Hopefully with all the pawns intact, but... Uh, Roberto's going to make the best of it, and uh, knight e3 is looking to trade more pieces, get them off the board. The queen on f8 guards the pawn on d6, and I think Roberto's just giving his head that shake of like, okay, that was a terrible blender that I just did, but at the same time, we can we can work with this. You know, this is not this is not over. It's far from over because the extra pawn on e5, normally when you have extra material and if pieces get traded, you want to have a pass pawn. It's not that easy to push that pawn. So Roberto's position is worse. There's no denying that. But if the queens come off now, like mm -hmm. how is black going to win this game? The, the sort of the burden is on Lawrence to prove that he can win. His position is great. No yeah, denying it. Is. But uh, maybe Roberto has some chances. Definitely. If that knight was on e4, I mean, I think you'd have maybe more than chances. Uh, I think it was actually really good that Lawrence played the move knight f2, which sort of went unnoticed, but it traded away the knight on e4. And uh, it means that the knight on e3 just is not attacking the d6 pawn while blockading as well. It's a good piece, but I think that was actually really smart by Lawrence. Yeah, he's playing this part perfectly. Look at this bishop on h3. There's no rook f1 for you. Look at the knight on f6. There's nothing coming to e4. And now knight g4 is an idea for black, saying let's trade off the knights, get my bishop in g4. I'll use the f file, not just to say, hey, my rook looks good, but to even attack. Bishop h6 is another move for black. We've been talking about a bishop staring into its own pieces. Why not trade it for that good knight on e3? Yeah, and knight g4 immediately, not only does it prevent g4, but, I mean, this just looks fantastic. I, I like the move e4 by black, getting the pieces out, maybe just taking advantage of the open file, bishop d4, bishop takes b2. I think rook e8, if you take it, obviously, like this is just all flowing beautifully. Yeah, and rook f1 is a necessary move because if the trade happens, b2 hangs, but so does e4. At least white has some chances. It's only one pawn. That's a, an important pawn, and black is going to play with a free hand. But the material, if it starts trading off, there could be chances to hold. So look at this move, Rookie. Yeah. I like that. Rookie eight is just beautiful. Yes. Really, really well played. The clock. All yep. of a sudden, Roberto's done to 18 seconds, and Lawrence is over a minute and a half. And remember last game, where it was Lawrence in time trouble, and then Roberto went rookie six and then dropped in exchange at that moment? Mm -hmm. Lawrence is keeping up the pressure. Look at this move, Bishop D4. Wow. Please take me. Help my pawns push forward here. Lawrence is really in good shape right now. He is. And and bishop d4 is one of those moves that is not what you want to see when you have 18 seconds ticking down. No, your pieces are frozen, right? You, you know you don't want to take, but you also don't want to move the bishop because the b2 pawn is hanging. So you're just stuck in place. Yeah, he needs moves. He's I don't even see moves at some point. <laughs> bishop d1 is a good move, all things considered, because if we yeah. trade bishops, then my king just comes to e2 and... Once again, I'm going to ask that question of how does black make progress? You have a, an extra e pawn, but I can blockade it with my king. And where are you going from there? Right. Yeah, bishop 
the the light squared bishops are actually the ones you sort of want on the board as black based on you know the c4 pawn and the d5 pawn if you were to trade on c3 and keep those bishops you would have pretty good chances in the enemy is he going to go like bishop g2 no okay he is going to trade yeah and well i'm serious though where to from here like, i'm trying to figure out how black does this maybe rook e5 pawn b5 but you can't move your rook off the e file without dropping this pawn e4 so even if you try to break open the position there are some drawbacks that are very clear so how does black make progress here hmm yeah maybe like king g7 g5 king g6 uh kind of Wait, stuff bishop takes d4 bishop takes d4 was a free pawn the, Wait, the, he played e3 there? Oh my yeah. goodness. Yeah. And okay, he's going rook f2 check and he still has some chances, but Black could lose this game. A timely rook e6 will win the d6 pawn. And I cannot tell wow. you how many times this has happened to me where I'm yep. like, oh, I'm playing really well. I'm up a pawn. I get to an end game. I'm up a pawn. Trading down is good, but then you lose the d6 pawn. And also, Lawrence now at 15 seconds. Roberto has four seconds remaining, and Lawrence is having a struggle here. Yep. Okay, just go rook back to e4 next and then rook e6. Just start pre moving. Here it comes. Oh, white can easily win this game, rookie six. And this is scary. No, it is really scary. Play rookie six. Oh, but there's. Then you can take the pawn. Yeah, the h4 pawn and then e2, like as a sacrifice at some point. Is oh. he trying to promote the d pawn? Rook g4? Oh. Rook g4. Rook d7. Rook g4. Rook d7. Just push the pawn. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's amazing. That's wild. The king c4? I think the king could start running up the board here. Yeah, I think so. And he's going to realize that right now. Here it comes. Here it comes. Watch out. King d5. I think white's winning. Yeah, oh white's for sure winning. Rook king. d4? Or no, d7. D7 and then rook d4 doesn't work. And now the c pawn runs. Hang yeah, on. Yeah, wait. What just happened? Rook d4. Rook, d... <laughs> rook d2 doesn't work. Yeah. I was trying to go rook d2 too. I was like, wait. But no, this is winning for white all of a sudden. Oh, this, this is, is completely is... winning now. A whirlwind. By the way, if this rook were behind the pawn, which is where it typically wants to be, black would have been able to push those pawns. So because it was on the second rank, it covered both. Wow. And the same thing that happened to Roberto just happened to Lawrence, right? Which is completely winning. You have the upper hand. It was a piece earlier. Now it was only a pawn, but it was a pawn plus everything that comes with it. So this was, you know, definitely at the same level of the previous advantage that Roberto had and messed up. So Lawrence has just experienced everything, every emotion in, in this match, Robert. And he is leading this match still, and we're getting back to the game one position, but Roberto looked at this, you can tell. Roberto quickly changed his move order, and sure. now he stretched the E5, and it's up to Lawrence to justify his pawn sacrifice. He has plenty of life in this position, all of his minor pieces. Look at them in the center. You can castle, go in the F-file, but you are down a pawn. So we'll store that for just a second. And I want to say quickly that even though Lawrence is up a point in this match, he may not yep. feel that way. He just lost a game yep. where he was up a pawn, a clean pawn where he was out playing his opponent. So he probably is feeling a bit down on himself as most chess players do when they fail to convert. And not just that, they end up losing a game they have no business losing. And can we talk about how wildly different Roberto's position is? You remember the first time they played this line? It was a closed position. There was a king on G3. Now it's like, hang on, knight takes e3. That's the most important piece on the board for white. And black just castles and puts a knight on e5. I mean, what's going on here? Lawrence's position looks very bad to me. And it's going to be needed to be tactically justified, I think. Right. And that's why knight d to b5 was played. Yeah. And I'm trying to figure out, like, should I take that knight or should I just drop my queen to e7? He drops queen to e7. And the biggest difference is like the flow of white's pieces with these two knights on c3 and b5, even though white keeps the material, you can't jump around with your other pieces quite as well. So that's a very interesting moment there by uh, Roberto to just play queen e7. You're already up some material. The bishop on e3 is under attack. I can take the knight on b5 next turn. Let me just make sure I'm not getting checking queen e5. <laughs> queen e5 hits h2 and c3. <laughs> what move is knight a7? This move is absolutely wild to me. I this it's like a form of tilt almost. Yeah, knight knight takes a7 is just ludicrous. Like the knight isn't attacking anything, it's now trapped. The the threat is knight takes e3. What black's about to castle. White's position is just shambles. Bishop takes c3, knight takes e3. They're both hanging by some, you know, by some way or another. Black's gonna win huge and that's why lawrence is saying all right look we're, we're just going all in get the get the bankroll out we're going knight d5 
Yeah, but if pawn takes, queen takes e3 is checked. So you steal a bishop and trade the queens. You would not yeah. be able to take on e3 if the king were on h1 because of rookie one ideas with a pin. So I think Lawrence can try knight c8 here just to uh, say I'm losing yep. a piece regardless. Let me keep on having some fun. But after knight c8, there could be queen c7, something like that to threaten mate on h2 and get the queen out of trouble. But then there's bishop f4. So you have to be careful still if you're Roberto. Yeah, I'm just trying to think of the material because if you go knight c8, queen c7, bishop f4, you just take on c8 and castle. Um, <laughs> you know, and you're going to be up a piece. You know what's funny is I wasn't actually visual, even though I said knight c8, I wasn't visualizing the knight being on c8. So I was like, oh, what do I do after bishop f4? Well, queen takes c8 is a free piece there. So yeah, that's a good call. Oh, man. He does. Yeah, so of course he is going to play knight c8. <laughs> he's not happy about it. Um, and Roberto is just, I mean, he's got four and a half minutes, it's a five minute game. This might actually end so quick, we get another five minute game, which is crazy. Uh, it's two and a half minutes ticking down on the match clock, but we might actually get another one because this is so bad for Lawrence already. Question for you. If you're Lawrence and let's say you lose this game because it looks losing, do you just waste the rest of your time? Do you essentially let your time run until the five plus one segment is over with and then take your break and try to refresh yourself? I, I think yes. Um, just because of how the last two games have gone, I don't think he's in the right headspace to play more five-minute games. And I think it just could be like more of a surge for uh, Roberto, especially because, you know, he's about to get the white pieces as well. I agree. So queen takes c8 here. You're up a full piece. You can just castle to safety. And castle looks good. Yeah, blacks up a minor piece for no compensation whatsoever. But I think Lawrence is just playing this out of his system. Uh, that's what... I believe he's doing at this point. I'm dead lost. I don't even have the chances I did in the previous games when I was losing. I'm just going to play some moves and just try to forget about this. this <laughs> and is... if he wins it, he's gonna be he's gonna be absolutely animated. I can't can't <laughs> wait to see that kind of Lawrence because we saw how he was after he won the game down a piece. So imagine if he wins this. This is totally over. This is Roberto's game. And Roberto needs this win to tie this match up at three and a half. So this is just absolutely crucial. He can't mess this up. Yeah, and things started getting away from Lawrence in the draw. When it was three to one, we had a break. We get back. Lawrence was in time trouble. It felt like he didn't quite feel at home in this opening where we were saying, that's a, what are we, in the Super Grandmaster Classical Tournament with that right. uh, white side of the Rio Lopez. And he got a good position, but it was complicated. He was burning clock. So Lawrence needs to find the opening weapons that suit him. I do believe that this opening can be good for him it was in game one but roberto studied it and then said oh, okay i'll handle it in a more tactical manner myself and i'm not material yeah knight e4 here looks like knight e4 the reason it looks so good is that it trades every single piece so right. the bishop on b3 is being hit by the knight right now then knight e4 hits the bishop on e5 and it just means that everything disappears from the board which is usually the easiest way to win the game when you're out material yeah, knight takes b3, knight e4, bishop takes d5, rook e8. You, you're, you're up a full piece, and there's no attack because none of white's pieces remain. So, Roberto, he's got this one. He's just spending his time, and he does, in fact, play knight to e4. Yeah, and we'll just see trades. Um, more trades, I imagine. I would probably, like, take on b3 and just go maybe, like, f5 or something. Yeah, or take if I rook e6 and take this pawn on d6. Oh, knight c3 is a tactic coming up. Just right, the knight four, c3 and, and time is officially up. So knight c3 will win the game right now, or f5, rookie six, any of them. Um, but the time is up. So we will actually be ending the five minute portion after this. And it looks like it's going to be tied up. Wow. And Roberto, I, he hasn't been too like emotive there, but he just responded with like a, like grabbed his face. Like, Phew. I'm glad I just even the score up because this yep. has been a true battle. And Amon, I got to ask you before we go to break, what are your thoughts as we head into the three plus one? What does each side need to continue doing? And what does each player need to do differently? Well, <laughs> Roberto needs to keep playing that Karakon because <laughs> now it's up to Lawrence to say, uh, okay, you know, the first game might've been great, but this game was just unacceptable. This was just wild, terrible. Uh, Roberto clearly looked at this and that paid off. So uh, just those small fixes in the breaks uh, that Roberto is doing are clearly working for him. Lawrence needs to get back to um, what worked for him in the beginning part, right before we took our halftime break. Uh, Lawrence has been playing really good chess, and I hope that he just doesn't forget that. Um, he doesn't think that, oh, uh, this is going terribly for me. I'm playing poorly. 
and then maybe start playing out of tilt with different openings, quicker openings. I think he needs to maintain the fact that this guy's higher rated than me, but I am sticking with him and going toe to toe and I can play chess at his level. I think that's a great point that the results may be tricky to deal with because while he's lost a couple games here, his play overall has been exceptional. So you're right, Amon. He needs to remember that there were good times in recent past. Let them continue on. We will take a quick break. In return, we'll get right back to this matchup in a short time control in the I'm Not a GM Speeches Championship brought to you by Chess.com.
Well, if you can't stick around all day on your computer watching Aman and I commentate this match, you know, go on the go, download the app, play some good chess, play your friends, have a great time. And it's just, it's free and you'll have a good time playing. So Aman, as we get back to the over the board action, we have Lawrence, we have Roberto, we have three and a half points per side. Who's going to win this one? My goodness. I mean, this, this is, uh, I think you and I were hinting at it before the match. Um, on and off stream that this was maybe going to be one of the closest matches one of the hardest to call I was looking at the chat the, the the prediction poll for the five minute portion was Roberto to win or Lawrence to win or draw and it was 51 to 49 percent it's like literally at the closest I've ever seen the chat poll um, you know for those channel point uh, degenerates and what we see here is a tied match going into the three minute portion um, what I see is that if the tilt and the, the effect of the last couple of games starts to affect Lawrence in what I can only imagine should be a negative way, um, if it starts to affect him at all, I think it will be negative. And I think that spells disaster for him as Roberto seems to have had a shaky start, but he's just starting to warm up. And I know firsthand, you know, how tricky he can be in the bullet portion. Lawrence is going to be very competitive in bullet, but I think Roberto just has that that extra oomph, that upper hand in bullet. So I'm concerned that if things trend in that direction, uh, the bullet portion is gonna favor him. It's more about whether Lawrence can get back to what was working at the beginning. That's a fair point. And the way I see this match, I feel like I haven't found either player separate themselves because one game Lawrence is down to 20 seconds. The next game, Roberto is down to 20 seconds. And sometimes you see a trend of one player is just getting time trouble and that will never be good for them, but it's been a back and forth battle of through and through. And right now we see the center locked up. This Bishop on C8 is starting there. It hasn't gone to B7 and the previous game, Lawrence had to bring the Bishop back. He did a great job doing so, but this could save him a tempo. Yeah. It's kind of interesting because there's a line with h3, bishop d3, and this pawn is on b7. So I don't know whether it matters, but there's a there's a move pawn b6, which is there for free. <laughs> yeah, and that could be a bad thing, though, because the white knight can go to d4 and into c6. Uh, right now, knight d4 is tempting me, but I'm sure there are tactics all across this board here. Black is threatening to go b4. The b5 pawn is hanging. You could take that, but opening the b file would allow the b2 pawn to feel quite loose. So instead, Roberto just plays a3, the calmest move in the position. And I think this is still theory, more or less. I think it's a6, knight d4, bishop b7 um, is sort of how things go here. But um, this is, again, an opening that worked well for Lawrence when he used it last. So it makes sense that he's going back to this. Yeah, I actually find white's position to be much harder to play at this point, because what's your actual plan? If I give white another turn, what are you going to do? There could be some E5 tactics. We saw Roberto rely on that in a previous game where you make this move E5 and break open the position. That was different because that was a more defensive plan. Here, E5, well, right now, you, you tend to be long enough. Oh, I wanted to play E5 so badly. Yeah, in, in that position, it makes a lot of sense as well because if the bishop's on B7, okay, E5 makes maybe less sense. There's rook D8 and the D5 pawn is being hit. But what we see here is actually kind of surprising. I feel like they don't go together. Bishop d7 and a6. I feel like if you're playing bishop d7, where's a5? Where's b4? If you're playing aggressively, that's the way to go. But neither side is trying to push forward at this point. As you just said, a6, bishop d7, those don't go hand in hand. And if you're playing bishop d4, rook e1, all this stuff, don't you usually play e5? So I think yeah. he's now considering it. And there it is. You, you could tell by the fact that he spent 20 plus seconds and now he's breaking free. And I like white's position. Um, so I would have given real thought to the move. Uh, Bishop takes e5 uh, and follow it up with queen d4. That that puts like a lot of pressure on g7. Also hits the knight. Uh, wow. Okay. That's just such a weird move, leaving the knight hanging like that. I mean, I get that the, the knight is loose, but it makes me think of like knight takes f7. Like what's going on here? Knight takes f7 should just be a good move. You win a pawn. Roberto plays it. And look at Lawrence. He did not at all see that move. He just shakes his head in disbelief. And you mentioned tilt. Starting to feel like we're getting tilt. Yeah, this is so uncharacteristic, um, what I'm seeing here, because I mean, this is just falling apart here. This is completely busted. 
yeah, you just drop a pawn on f7, and that's such an important pawn. If you drop the h7 pawn and put a pawn back on f7, your king feels safe. Maybe you can fight back in the game like Roberto did when he was down a pawn. Here, the king is open. There's still chances for black, of course. That bishop on g7 remains a monster. The pawn on d5 is an isolated pawn. It's a pass pawn. But if you can attack it, then you may be able to win it. So Roberto has his work cut out for him. He is up a pawn here, and he needs to figure out the right path forward. Yeah, and I mean, trades... Obviously, if uh, if things simplify too much, maybe he has a chance in the end game and we can sort of say, hey, that's a more active king, but it's a long way to go before we get that. And d6 might indicate ideas like rook e7, getting that pawn even further up the board, bishop f8 played, and man, Lawrence is just grasping at straws because he can't even take this pawn on d6 yet. No, he cannot. And I would love to get my queen to d5 or something like that, but your knight's there. And I think that Lawrence needs to put his bishop on c6. And I think he'll make that move now. But the problem with playing bishop c6, at least psychologically, is you allow d7. d7 is covered for the moment, but you need to blockade the piece. And hey, he's one move away from playing knight to d7. The problem right. with that being, where are the pieces defending your king again? So if you bring your yeah. knight to the center of the board, your king is not very happy. No, it's a, a good point because um, I wanted to also give some credit to Roberto for this move, rook d1. Um, there's nothing the black rook can do in the e-file. The white rook, however, supports the pawn, uh, ready to you know, push it forward even further. Queen f4 is now possible uh, going towards the king side. I think that he's doing very, very well here. He is, and I think he needs just a, another avenue of attack. And g4, threatening g5, it's too obvious, and you risk your own king's safety. So you need to find a way to make inroads in another manner. I'm looking to, at some point, put my knight on e4, so maybe pawn f3, yes. but that also has some risk to it because you start pushing the pawns in front of your king, it feels a little less safe. A little bit loose, a little bit loose. You know, as soon as you start thinking about g4 and trying to go g5, taking advantage of the pin, you just tell yourself, eh, it's, you know, it's playing g4. That's kind of a weakness, and you think twice about it. And he plays knight d5. He's just saying, I am going for the kill immediately, and yeah. the rook is... Uh, immune from capture the knight is pinned of course in f6 king g8 the rook will just slide back that's all good and fun the one thing that i'm looking at long term is this bishop on g7 and that pawn on b2 if you don't see that when this knight moves exactly to d7 and for some reason you forget maybe that bishop can go ahead and steal that pawn and that's why bishop d4 was played yeah bishop d4 is unfortunately so strong um this queen uh, queen takes d6 bishop takes okay so yeah this is just this should be fine. Yeah, you're trying to like come up with counterplay here for Lawrence. You <laughs> are about even the clock. Under 30 seconds, it will be a bullet game. And what you would ideally have is the bishop on g7 traded for the bishop on c2, not when and the queen's off the board. Because the knight is blockading on a light square, you don't want to see a light square bishop come attack your knight later. So he just doesn't have any guard for his king. And I expect that there will be a checkmate in the near future. The bishop can come to e4 and into d5 if you're not careful. Oh, g4 now, just great. There's the g4 move. Played with confidence. And uh, now g6 is weak. As soon as h6 happens, you know, you, you start looking at the g6 pawn as a potential target. Right. And, well, I don't like bishop before walking into a pin. So rook e2, maybe rook e3, but rook d7. That, down goes the d6 pawn. Wow. And you Queen don't care. d6 but... and rook d2. I think black might win this game, believe it Definitely. or not. Definitely. Definitely. Okay, so rookie six, good move, hitting the knight, hitting the a6 and the h6 pawns. You can, oh, look at that move. Roberto has wow. been so sharp with the pins today. That was just great awareness. And now black can't move. Yeah, it's just stuck. Rook d7, mm -hmm. h4, f4. Yes, we can't go rook d3. The bishop covers the square. So wow. good on Lawrence trying to get those pawns, though, but that king might get mated. There might be a mate against the king on f6 somehow. Okay. Yeah, it's so hard to, to orchestrate, but you're thinking about it. You are. And, well, here goes the C pawn, but take on H6. Is the H pawn promoting with mate? Oh what is goodness. happening here? Now there's some knight moves. C2? Take it, and then take what? on D5. Yeah, that was a blunder. C2 is just not it. You know, if... You, I, Wait, I, this I, is actually a really tricky move. Knight B4? Knight B, okay, or take on G5 first, maybe, and then knight B4. You're right. Oh, Rook C7, King D6. Yeah, he's just going to take it. Oh my oh gosh. My goodness. What the hell is going on? <laughs> I don't know. And there are three pawns going Rook G2. King F4 and then King E3. Oh, and then you take oh, on Rook H7. 
What is happening? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> okay, we're going to see a draw. That's Oh, it. my God. Oh, my gosh. What happened here? <laughs> we're laughing because we have we can't wrap our heads around all of these moves that were played. And it was a scramble. say things that fast. No. <laughs> oh, and who is more upset about that game? Uh, that's Roberto. a good question. I think, I think Roberto for sure. Um, I think Roberto for sure, just because he, he was winning, like even after he maybe messed things up, he still played so well. Like he, he got that pin in, as you mentioned, that was key. Yeah. He's been very alert for those pins, the game where he won up a piece earlier and then even lost that game. Uh, he, he's been seeing that very well. And Lawrence, you could tell during that game, he did not see night takes up seven. So tactically it feels like Lawrence is not in his finest form these last bunch of games but that is where he really makes his mark so we'll see how this game goes it's a Karakan it's a more closed position and that to my eyes benefits Roberto yeah this is not um something we've seen before because the last time we saw the Karakan of course it was that poison pond variation right and here at Black can Keep this queen on b6, play knight d7. At some point, consider f6, a thematic break. But this is Roberto's style. Come on, Lawrence. Let's go to the end game, buddy. I will outplay you. We have all eight pawns on the board. And Lawrence is a fantastic end game player. It's just not what he enjoys playing. So that's why he dropped yep. his queen back to d1. Yep, absolutely. Queen a6, uh, still on a good diagonal. So it's not like Black you know, misplaced his pieces to offer that trade. If Black ever goes for c5, knight c6 to put some pressure, there might be time for just knight a3, knight b5, which is a like really, really good square for white. Hitting d6, hitting c7, and well, actually c5 has been played. And I would play knight a3 in a heartbeat. And here it comes. The knight's coming right to b5. And you can technically castle queen set. I would not. It, oh, I was going <laughs> to say I would not advise that. But he says, what do you know? I am going to castle. And perhaps white can't actually attack that black king. Well, there you go. Castle king b8. I am not too impressed by this queen on a6 i feel like you got to get rid of that knight like knight a7 or something knight a7 would be good right now and bishop e7 a bit slow but white can go for f5 you have so much more space in this position from lawrence's perspective and so i would have played f5 and this is why i would have played f5 first because now if you play f5 good luck to your king on g1 maybe it escapes perhaps it's fine but that's not what you want to open up the king side when your king is the only one there. Yeah. So h5, do you play g5 as white here? Oh. That's the question. Because g5, of course, the f5 square is gone, but the g6 pawn is weak and kind of a decision you have to make. If you play g takes h5 at some point, you have the better structure maybe for an end game, but <laughs> we're far from the end game. We're very far from the end game. And I did not like that choice by Roberto because this is thematic. If someone takes on d4, you want a knight on d4 poking at this e6 pawn. So look at this. You trade away black's defensive knight. And now that knight on b5, you said it's going to be a pain. It remains. So what are yeah. you going to do about that knight long term? Very strong piece. I mean, there's definitely just gh5, rook h5 to be considered here. I, I would probably play that, honestly, because the queen is so offside on a6 that I'd say, look, you can play rook D to G8 check. I'll go king F3 or king F2 with my rook on H5. And I, I think I'm covering everything there. Yeah, it's one of those decisions where, as a commentator, I completely agree with you. And I know if I was playing the game, I would never do it. I'd be like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's too risky. Can't go for that. But you're right. That there was a possibility. And here, I don't like the fact that the pawn is on B4 because your C3 pawn looks a bit in trouble the rook c8 rook c4 i'm going to use mm -hmm. the square in front of that backward pawn that's often what you want to do so i do think that black has plenty of play against this king because it's on g2 so now if you take on h5 roberto of course will take back open up a check that king is in trouble yeah and he might be relying on like rook c8 knight d6 stopping uh rook c4 but it just opens up the floodgates for uh queen e2 check and everything everything falls like as soon as that knight moves uh, it's it's big trouble. But queen b6 is like totally different than, than I thought. Um, not what I expected at all. This is falling apart for black. Yeah, the e6 pawn is hanging. Knight c6 check is forking, and a rook b1 should just win Clean a pawn. Here. All right, a5 first. One of these moves just to go for it. And so b6 for sure. Or, or sorry, knight c5, rook b5, rook c8 could happen. Wow, that's like barely hanging on there, but he's going to rely on b6 and 
try to keep that pawn stuck. The problem is normally you plant your king in front of the pawn, it would be an umbrella pawn. Your king feels safe with the pawn on b6, but not when the knight's coming right back to b5 and into the d6 square. Knight b5, d6 is nasty. Um, I would almost start with that. Yeah, I, I, I would feel like starting with that makes sense. Although, can I take an a5 now? Because if you go knight d6 check, my king goes to c6. It looks scary, but you take my rook, I take yours. That's a fair trade. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty That's pretty nice. Knight d6, king c6. Oh, I, and I, I read Lawrence's lips there. <laughs> he was not happy that b takes a5. He missed it. He didn't see it coming. No doubt he was uh, just noticing that it uh, completely foiled his plans. And if you go rook b7 or something aggressive, rook b8, the knight's guarding that square. It's super frustrating. And this is what's happening, right? We are going to trade rooks. The black knight can go to c5, where it covers the e6 pawn and the a6 square. Then that pawn on c3 is a bit loose. So I think that Roberto that has king. the upper hand. Maybe we run the, the king here. Is that the way to go? Looks pretty good. But perhaps Roberto's saying, I'm, I'm too quick myself. I'm going to win your c3 pawn, and my d pawn can start running. Or is that good enough, though? Can you play I g5? Don't know. As, as white, you play rook a6 check, and you don't calculate rook takes b6. Like, if you can't trade the rooks, I don't agree with the check, because it, it feels like I'm sort of handing the move over. But uh, White's plan is Wait, clear, Rook C8, Rook C8, you win a piece. I was about oh to say Rook C8 is mate, but now Rook C8 is no longer mate, but the knight can't be defended. <laughs> and Lawrence. <laughs> Lawrence is so animated. Wait, <laughs> whenever, <D4? laughs> whenever that happens, I just look over at the cam. Yeah, he's shaking his hand. He's like, I got the hot hand now, but that was the first time I saw Roberto react, and he was, look at him, he's still shaking his head. He can't get over the fact that he just blundered that completely. Because there's been so many examples of that in this match. Piece up, totally winning, and it just flips in a single move. It's yes. crazy. He's going to resign that. And Roberto, and look at Lawrence, triumphant there. But Roberto yeah. did not play his best game. I think we should be clear about that. He is a fantastic player, but he just didn't find the way to coordinate his piece as well. And he made some decisions that end up being very questionable, like you know, taking on d4 at first and then giving... Uh, Lawrence's free attack on the queen side, but then he found the right moves in critical moments. He took on a5, exactly. he got his king to c6, rook to b8, and he was turning it around. And so you kind of forget about how bad your position was. And then you remember, wait, I was playing for the win, and then two moves later, I lose a piece. No, that's a that's a good point. But I think overall, he would be the first to agree with you that that wasn't start to finish the best game that he's put together this match. Um, and Lawrence is, I mean, he's taking his chances, man. When he gets an opportunity, he takes it. Um, he's not really missing these these free pieces. It's more that like sometimes we get positions where he wins that piece and then can't convert after that. But luckily in this game or that last game we just saw, it was too easy after winning that piece. So he, he does take that point and take the lead in this match again, five to four and a good start to the three minute section for Lawrence. And this has been a very high level match. I'm impressed by both players to this point. And Lawrence is a point ahead. He's in great shape. And right now in this position, that knight on h3, it's such a thorn in white side. It looks trapped. It has nowhere to go, but you can't attack it. And the bishop on c8, it returns to a starting square. It defends it. And you have to watch out for tactics involving pawn f5, temporarily giving up that knight for the attack. I like Lawrence's position. Bishop g4 to start with might be first and then f5. Yeah, bishop g4 looks like a nice move because uh, you can almost ignore it. Like bishop g4 b4 it's like okay f5 maybe like he, you can almost just run run forward with the pawn because that pin to the queen is so nasty and none of white's pieces can really come to its defense yeah and lawrence says queen d7 he's wow. thinking for the checkmate he's like well i'll lead with my queen and there could be some knight f4 check sacrifices with you know queen h3 to follow actually can you get away with that I was just like saying queen it. H3 and bishop g4. Yeah, I was sort of saying it in broad terms, but now that I'm looking at it, that could work. That would be nuts. And there it goes. <laughs> so queen h3, king h1, bishop g4, and then if rook e3, do you just take back on f4? That's what I was thinking. And you're hitting everything, hitting the knight, hitting yeah, literally every piece. I don't think this changes anything. You can still go queen h3. It's the same line. Although now you can move your knight. So knight h4, 
I'm not sure if that's a good move, but at least you stop checkmate bishop g4. You can put pawn f3 to block the bishop. So there's a little more flexibility in the approach. You can also take on f4 with the bishop on uh, c1. I don't really like that because e takes f4 and your knight on c3 hangs. Oh, right. this is a wild position. This is spicy already. I think Lawrence is, if this works, like if you can play knight f4 and it can't be taken, you're already on the right path. That's right. And you just can't get complacent, right? You had a good tactic, but you need to keep it up. And for Roberto, he's down over half a minute on the clock. He's trying to figure out, can I take this knight in f4? Do I just have to leave it there? Should I play knight h4? That also looks wrong because even a move like bishop f6 to just try to take that knight looks pretty good for black. And he plays rook g1 when it's all said and done. But bishop g4, it looks menacing, but maybe that knight on c5 can be captured. Come on, what's going on here, man? Well, what's going on is you just came up with a, a Kantyism. Rook g1, and it's all said and done. That's <laughs> that, that's one right there. We gotta we gotta remember that one. Rook g1, it's all said and done. Uh, Bishop g4. I, what's going on? I literally have no idea, but I love it for Black. I'm here for it. This this is exactly what Lawrence wants from every game. If he could if he could have it, he would play this way every single game. And I love it. We've got f4 coming. He's got a knight that's hanging on the board, but he plays bishop g4 and he says, I don't care at all. So if you take the knight, queen h5, you're going to lose your knight in f3. Can you just sacrifice your queen? Not my queen, but a move like knight h4 there or something. So you can take my queen, I'll take back with my bishop. Your queen right. on h5 is in trouble. Your knight in f4 is under attack. I'm threatening you on the queen side with my pawn. I think that might be the practical choice necessary, but you have 28 seconds counting down now for Roberto. You just need to move, and I'm sacking my queen for sure now. Yeah, it, it's crazy. At this point, you have to come to that conclusion that it's a good idea, and that's so hard to do. It really is. Um, taking this knight and then giving up the queen, I think you win this knight as well. So you do get your three pieces, but if he doesn't find that, I think he's just lost. He's got six seconds, and the clock is ticking. Okay, he does take it. So that he makes the good decision, but he doesn't have enough time left to keep on playing. Wow. All right, he does it. He's, he is a very good bullet player, though. If he doesn't lose this game, Amon. That's wow. insane. It's absolutely insane. But two this, minutes to four seconds. This position is harder to play for black from, oh, there's nothing left to play because it's time to play. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> Did you see Roberto? He is yeah. so angry. And I don't even think he looked at his clock really. And Lawrence was like, yes. I did it. I'm, he was so proud of himself there. But honestly, from a chess perspective, just that final position was yeah. so immensely complicated. It was. And I think it was easier to play for white if Roberto was able to get his move off. Yeah. No, this this is like uh, the, the type of chess that we're seeing right here. You've said it, and I'll just echo it again. It's really high level. Like both guys are playing really well. The games, like there's blunders here and there, but this is speed chess. You're going to have pieces hanging from time to time. You're going to have blunders, but we haven't seen egregious, egregious mistakes yet. Um, so I just think we've been treated to, to a very high level match. And Lawrence, the underdog, surely coming into this is performing. He's up two games right now, setting us up for a potential lead from him going into the bullet and a very exciting finish, Robert. And we have seen swings before. Lawrence, he was jetting out to a two-game lead in the longest time control. Roberto stormed right back to tie it. So right now, we're going to go to break. Lawrence Trent is really thrilled about his performance. He's up two games. But Roberto Molina will try to bounce back. R remain seated. We'll be back shortly.
and we return Lawrence Trent with a six to four lead over Roberto Molina. Aman, Lawrence has been mighty impressive. It's been shaky for both players at times, but ultimately this has been a well-fought match. And I think Lawrence has earned his lead thus far. Absolutely. And uh, not only has this been a great match, entertaining from both sides, there's been their fair share of blunders, but it's been a very high-level match. And when you have these high-level matches, someone has the lead, it's fully deserved. Like when people are flagging in this time control, they have a tough position. Like in this match, we haven't seen people uh, just running out of time with a completely winning position, which we've seen in so many speed chess matches. What we're seeing here are players putting their opponents in tough positions and then the clock running out. So all the, the points that the players have feel totally deserved. And we have six, four right now for Lawrence Trent. We're at the halfway point of the three minute portion. And uh, is your feeling that Lawrence has to keep up a lead going into the bullet? Or, I mean, if it's a, a tied match, it could be anyone's uh, game in the bullet portion. Yeah, at first I would have said that he would definitely need a lead, but the way he's been playing and the time trouble that Roberto's been getting into, I think Lawrence is better prepared and he understands the foundations of these positions very well. Right. And back to this um, same line that they, they played last time and now allowing A5 is Roberto. So last time he played A5 and this was one of the games, Robert, that you were mentioning. Uh, Roberto might be the first to admit that wasn't his best game uh, in the format. Yeah, it really wasn't. And it went from locked up to tactical all of a sudden. And I don't think he made the switch that well. And look at Lawrence. He says, I'm going to take on D3 with my pawn. My pawn structure is not very good, but what are you going to do for black? How are you going to break in this position? Oh, guess what? You're going to play C5. Well, that undoubles my pawns in the process. So Lawrence, I don't like the look of his pawn structure, but it, it is his type of position, even if it's not mine. Yeah, and when I see F4, I was going to say the first move I would play is H5. And the reason that F5 is being played is, I mean, if you just look at the position with the move like G5 in there, black goes G6, locks everything up, all light square pawns, dark square bishops on the board would be really good for black. So uh, he's played F5, and I think this is the perfect reaction. Whether it's the best move or not, you can't allow the, thing, the position to get locked up. And he takes an F5, so Lawrence... I think he's going to take back. There he goes. And this looks yeah. really promising for white all of a sudden. But Roberto is just saying, hey, I don't care. I'm the castle queenside. Get out of trouble. This this looks sketchy to me. Very sketchy. Bishop F4. Oh. Um, okay. So pawn being hit on F5. And you can't now, protect it. To, yeah, I know. You just like <laughs> wow. queen F3. It's kind of crazy. Wait, did he like wait for knight F3 so that he could play knight E7? Was he being a trickster there? It looked like it. I mean, knight d7 was played as a follow-up to pawn takes pawn, which doesn't seem really to do anything. And then knight f3, just kind of nonchalant. And then knight e7, it's like, wait a minute. Now he has to play, well, f6 and e6, neither move looks really good. No, they don't. And the pawn structure wasn't good for white to start with. The doubled pawns in the d file here. And now f5 is falling. So is there a way to quickly, say, castle, get your rook to the open f file and attack? Or is it just a pawn that you're being you're handing over to your opponent it looks like a pawn you're handing over i i don't really see a way out i mean queen g3 is available um taking a knight f6 this definitely doesn't smell right but you know lawrence is going to be one to complicate things instead of just handing over a pawn even if handing over the pawn is maybe the smarter or more objective choice and it is complicated indeed because queen g3 check can be played. Roberto refrains from doing so. He can do mm -hmm. so again now, but he chooses not to. So he just says, I'm going to get your pawn e6. I can play queen d6, go after that yeah. pawn. I can go knight f5, bring my knight to g3. I can castle queenside, and you don't really have an attack. So somehow this has turned in Roberto's favor very quickly. Yeah, the, the thing about the position here for... Um, Lawrence is that uh, the, his issues are on the light squares like knight f5 knight g4 are both going to happen there might be a long castle but to be honest even short castling makes probably even more sense for Roberto if he can get short castle here safely knight f5 bishop e7 or d6 there's still queen g3 looming now there's knight g3 this is just looking better and better um, for black because the, the pawns on the queen side look how they're fixed nothing can move here and this pawn chain for black is really really solid and rook g1 played, which means that Lawrence is going to castle queenside because he can't castle kingside anymore. So I, th I think bishop d6 just developed yeah. castle kingside, as you said. And Roberto's king is safe there because of 
the light square dominance. Is yeah, Lawrence going to so be good. able to sacrifice like a rook on g4 and exchange there and try to get an attack? I don't see it happening though. No, th this looks like it could be one of the cleaner games we've seen from this match where it almost looks one-sided from the start. There was that one game Lawrence had, which looked like pure tilt near the end of the five minute where it was like, just honestly, a very short game and uh, Roberto cleaned that one up. But this looks like, uh, you know, th a throwback to that because Kingside Castle, Rook A to E8, if White ever castles Queenside, there's Queen takes A5 as well. This is just looking crushing. And this is the downside of Lawrence's style. We've seen the benefits. He's played some marvelous attacking chess, but he yes. is he he tunnels. He's like, I want to attack and checkmate my opponent. And this happens with people of various styles. Sometimes if you're too positional, you may miss yeah. tactics and then get squeezed down because you give up all the space. So it is a stylistic decision. And I think that it is backfiring in this game. Overall, it's worked out right now, as you said, rook A to E8, rook F6, just win this pawn on e6 and once the position opens up it's white's king that's just a big danger and so it's kind of a funny move if king c2 i was really looking at knight h2 as like a a funny way that i think it seems to me like it just wins actually yes you're trying to distract that knight from the d4 pawn and well that's why knight g5 doesn't work because knight g5 right. would defend the e6 pawn but you're dropping d4 and then the knight hits the queen goes knight b3 check everything is falling apart and the reason that Lawrence played king c1 is he didn't want to put his king and queen on a square knight d4 would happen so that he could play knight g5. Let's be clear, knight d4 threatens knight b3, it wins a pawn in the center. I mean, knight f2 hits the d3 pawn and the queen. It does allow queen takes h5, so I certainly wouldn't uh, wouldn't consider it, but just knight takes e6, he's just going so solid, so, so comfortable here. And Roberto is going to take this game. It's like minus six in this position, Robert. Two extra pawns, but the... It's overwhelming, and rook a4 is a good move when you think that that rook was doing nothing. Maybe there will be a sacrifice on g4, but that seems like way too little, way too late. And black can play rook f2 here, bishop f4 to follow, you know, just taking over the board. Okay, well, is he going to sacrifice here? I feel like it's almost necessary. Um, don't think it's good. He's going to take with the queen. Bishop f4 looks like a strong response, looking for a queen trade. Again, there's little that white can do. Your, your attack, whatever you think your attack's going to be, it doesn't happen nearly quickly. But I didn't like queen f7. That no. invited the pawn to g6, and queen h5 is next for Check white. the time as well. That, uh, let's not forget about the clock, guys. 10 seconds ticking down here, and Lawrence is getting some of his attack going. And look at that move. Queen to d7, hitting the rook, hitting the bishop. Where does what even go here? Queen Seven seconds. Eight? Queen of eight might be the only move, hard move to play. Look, he just drops the bishop. Also, queen e6 check, and then try to get the rook to the h file. White yeah. is better. White's better. This is ridiculous. Wow. And we were just praising Roberto for playing like a pristine game. And now he's much worse. He's trying to somehow hold. Take on g6. Okay. The worst of your problems will be behind you once you take on g6. But now that a5 pawn, Ooh. which is weak the whole game, is going to queen. That A pawn is a big problem, and Queen H6 is crushing. That looks like a great move as well. Right. Knight F6 check. Where's that king going? Oh, my gosh. Where's the discover check? What? Where do we go? What? Wait. That, Knight E8? That seems move. just wrong. <laughs> okay, but he has Knight D6. Barely okay. holding things on here. Now, Knight, no, Knight C doesn't work because <laughs> their king would be in check. It's like a nice fork tactic. That oh, back Everyone back. has three seconds in this game. This is just wild. The G pawn runs. Okay, rook to check. The king goes d3 to drop b2, so g4 and g3. Keep it going. Okay, the, the bishop covers g1. That's important to remember. But the bishop does not match a8. I know it may... Oh, okay, this is getting increasingly relevant, you know? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> a7, but white's doing well here. Yeah. Should the, just be totally winning. Knight takes b5 and then bishop a3. <gasps> yeah. Oh, my God, what a time! Oh, Lord's freaked out! Oh, my God. It's totally winning. Oh my gosh, Lawrence just freaked out. And uh, my Portuguese is not good enough to, to know what Roberto Molina just muttered under his breath there, but I'm sure it was a, a fine compliment towards his opponent. Yes, and uh, you lucky fill in the blank yeah. to himself. <laughs> <laughs> wow. What a reaction. What an end to that game. That It just feels like people are, are playing so well. These matches are are flipping around back and forth. What what we've actually seen being the weakness of these players, it seems like converting advantages. That that's the story of of this match so far.
and they just lose sight of their clocks. We saw Roberto in the game before the break. He sacrificed his queen, but then he just lost some time, and he spent so much time calculating it that he had no time remaining. So both players have been finding great ideas to survive. The defensive resourcefulness has been amazing with little time on the clock, but yet the conversion part, that's been a failure yeah. for both of them. Yep, and we talk about trading pieces. Here's one of those games. Everything is gone, and that's almost like, I feel like it's almost both players just relaxing a little bit. That's an incredibly adrenaline-filled match, and now we just get the guys, okay, let's just trade. Let's just have one of these games. It should be a dead draw, but uh, Roberto controls the only open file on the board, and eh, if I had to pick a color, I'd probably take white. Oh, for sure, and it's one of these situations where you're like, oh my gosh, I know I need to draw this game. I should draw, but then I make one inaccuracy and I'm on the defensive for the rest of the game. For example, like if queen d6 happens and yep. black is forced to trade there, that is zero fun for you. Yep. And the king gets in and white's piece is just more active. So uh, I think that what Lawrence has done is the right thing. He was trying to create some inroads on the queen side and now his queen remains active and his rook is also free to join the party in a second. Yeah, this is nice. This is nice. Um, I would take that. A3 is something you give consideration to, but not really when B4 is on the table. Right. And I would consider queen D4 for black. Like, let You took over the D file first. I'm going to take it back now. And if you take me, I have a pass pawn in the center. Mm -hmm. So instead, queen B4 makes perfect sense as well. I feel like both sides are just looking at this position, knowing that it should be equal with best play. And coming up with a real plan is not easy. So H4... Why not? Doesn't uh, really probably see each five <laughs> for the same reason. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't have an answer. Well, okay, now white can consider h5, and the point is it. to get <laughs> h6. And there it goes. Yeah, this feels like the first substantial mistake, I would say. And it's not that it's losing for black, it's nothing that drastic. But if you if you put h6, you're just tying black down to the defensive. Yeah. So rook d4 is fantastic by Lawrence. I would have played queen e3 before the rook got to the d file. Um, you want to support this h pawn that's going to tie the king down and just you know, be a nuisance basically later in the game. If this gets taken, he wants to say, look, I got rook b8, h6, and there's just going to be some sort of mating net ideas in the position at all times. That's right. And look at that pawn h6. How does black accurately fend off most of the pressure. It's not that Black is going to check or Rook A1 threatens checkmate. I don't think you can actually trade Rooks. The resulting position looks very bad for yep. uh, for Black. I think he might be going to, but I'm not sure that it's so good. He might be underestimating. Well, with Rook A8 coming, you might have to play Rook D1. And maybe there's just trade on D1 and then Black Queen goes to C2, just to eye that E4 pawn. But the issue mm -hmm. remains that at some moment, white can just give up some pawns and go checkmate. So queen d8 was king played. G2. King yeah, g2. King g2. Give up the b4 pawn. Queen, rook takes b4. There's even queen d2 or queen g5 is an idea. So take queen takes c3. Takes take c3. It. Exactly. Game that's over. The, and that's just a terrible blunder. The game's over. Just resign. And well, not only is the game over, Lawrence on camera was over. He just went away. He is really angry at this point. And Roberto, two straight games. He has won on a blunder, but I will give full credit to Roberto. His yeah. strategy in that game was perfect. He said, there will be zero tactics available to you. We're playing a positional game. I have the open file first. I push my H pawn and Lawrence just didn't react in the best manner. Yeah. And to me, it's so strange in those symmetrical positions. When someone plays H4, like you just play H5. Don't even think about it. I mentioned like, yeah, just play H5 because why not? But that's the structure you want. Letting white play H5. I know you were mentioning, oh, this is kind of a mistake, but it's hard to call that a big blunder when we're commentating because, I mean, okay, allowing H5 isn't a big deal, but that was the difference. That was the game. It gave White a plan. And before yep. that point, they were just kind of, hey, let's move here. I'll move there. So what? But you're right that it gave White a clear plan. And then Lawrence of Queen D8 to stop the Queen infiltrating on the dark squares. And then he blundered his rook the next move. So that was a tough go of things for Lawrence. Right now, he's the better pawn structure. Black's pawns are split on the queen side, a5 and c6. Pawn's best friend being another pawn you would like to protect in that manner. However, Black gets quick activity thanks to this d5 square, the semi-open b file with a rook b8 could be a nice thing. The b4 square, bishop coming to c5. I see the pieces coming alive right now for Black, and I'm actually starting to appreciate Roberto's position more and more. 
Yeah, although I, I like what Lawrence has done. I think preemptively g3 to, to cut knight f4, knight on e3, bishop d2, covering all the squares the knight might want to move to. So we'll see things like king e2, uh, rook h to c1, or rook a to c1. And uh, I think Lawrence is probably decently happy here. He has something to play for, and now he's hinting maybe he wants to play knight to c4. And wow, king d7. Now that is a move that I like, but at first I wouldn't even consider it. But look at this. The d5 knight covered the b6 square. No check for you there. He can now bring his rook from h8 there. It goes very quickly to b8. And yep. the king is perfect on d7. It will never be attacked. The pawn c6 is defended because of that king. So I like what Roberto has done. But now that we're here, Amon, what's the plan for either side? Yeah, I mean, white has, I think, a few moves uh, left in the tank, like maybe rook to c1 or d1 from the h file. There's f4 that, you know, white always has in his mind to fully connect that pawn chain. Um, a3 is something I would consider as white, but I think for now I'd probably leave it as it is, um, just on a2. So if a3 happens by block, I have the option to go b3 or take that. Um, a3 just gives up the b3 square, and I'm just not sure about that one. I, I don't like it, so... I think I'd bring the rook in, maybe try to connect the pawns. And bishop to b4 is looking to say, hey, I want to trade bishops and then play knight b4. And, and that looks like a good plan. Absolutely. So it was interesting that this game is might come down to the move a3 for either side. Whether it's good or not remains to be seen. But there is that idea for both going forward. So h6 by Roberto, just playing slowly. That pawn was under attack. It should not have been captured. Don't go full Fisher. Your bishop would have been caught over there. But you just don't even want to worry about that. And so he mm -hmm. plays h6. Now, what is white's move here? How do you improve your position? Rook d to c2, trying to double in the file. Then knight to b4. That doesn't look good. So he plays h4. And maybe he'll play f4, king f3, g4, and try to use the kingside push. So. But does that really get you anywhere? Um, I don't know if black has any threats upcoming. I mean, the idea of like rook b7, taking and taking on b2 definitely comes to mind. But you can take with the rook potentially and think about this pawn. There's all sorts of long-term considerations. White, on the other hand, h5 uh, followed by f4 doesn't seem like a bad way to fix those pawns on the king side. That's very true. And it said Lawrence goes knight d6. He trades off the bishops. The f7 pawn is under attack. And Lord Burt says it may be under attack, but your knight isn't well defended. I'm just going to play f6. And if f4, will black trade on e5 and bring the rook from b8 to f8? I, I guess that would have oh. been a thought. And king of the hill. What a move. Game over, right? King of the hill. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a winner. Lawrence is uh, going to get out of his chair and start screaming that the, the game isn't over yet. This is some issue. <laughs> and you can play rook a7 to b7 here because the knight on d6 can't capture the rook without dropping the rook on c4. So if you want to keep this tension alive, rook a to b7 feels like a good move. Mm -hmm. Look at him. He is reading your mind right now. Rook b7 and uh, b2 is hanging here as well. Um, because I think, again, if you take that, there's rook takes on d2. So actually does come packed with a threat. And if you take, right, you give up some ground there, and the e5 pawn could drop, and the d6 knight loses its stronghold. So right now it's a tough moment for Lawrence, and he is down by nearly 20 seconds at this point. So he needs yeah. to start moving more quickly. It's just a tough position to figure out. Yeah, and what, what a match we've had. It's been, you know different leaders at different points. Um, I'm trying to think back to the beginning of this this match, but uh, it feels like Lawrence has been the only one with a lead so far. Is that is that right? I don't think Roberto has been ahead so far. He never he's been has. tied, but I don't think he's been ahead. That's correct. He lost game one. He won game two, and then Lawrence started uh, with a winning streak. He come, came right. back, but he has never taken the lead. He's so on the verge right now. This is dangerous territory for Lawrence. We've seen him react to blunders, to losing on time, all this stuff. Right. If he goes down the match, that could spell full disaster and he can go on tilt. But look at this. It's locked up over here. I'm not sure who I prefer this position for because the knight on d5 is really strong, but so is that knight on d6. <laughs> yeah, and I don't know about, like, my instinct would be king d4. Maybe there was something wrong with king d4, but I would have played that instead of king f3. Yeah, maybe there is worried a, a timely G5. It doesn't, well, you right. can consider G5 yeah, even definitely. here. It has a lot of risk, though. Yeah, G5, the idea being um, if you play F takes and H5, that might be the issue. And I guess there's this. And, well, if you go and distract yourself on the king side, can I wait and then go Rook H4? Like, if you go Rook takes G5, can I just say Rook H4 and win your A4 pawn? 
right. Wow, the cross board gameplay there. Rook H4 going all the way back over to collect that ape on and then going rook a7 check. And black, of course, wants to say, look, I'm bringing the king up the board. There's no way I'm going backwards to king d8. I think you have to do something on the queen side. Play for your past c pawn. So a3, giving up a pawn, or in this case, the yes. night before, to start winning some of these queen side pawns. You need to try to promote that c pawn. And e5 is falling. So knight f7, seven. an ugly move, but perhaps force. And look at how Roberto. But what, what do you do, though? Yeah, this is looking very difficult. Knight takes e5 check. Maybe we'll get a liquidation. And you just play rook a8, but king f6. Don't take the pawn right away. Your rook is defending. Yeah. Oh, Ooh, I would have gone king f6. Okay. Still, I probably prefer black, though. Um, e5, e4, just by a small amount, though. Small amount. Yes. Black is more active. The rook on g4 cuts the king off. You can play e4 check. The king goes back to f2. And there goes black's king. But I think Lawrence has enough to hold this position. The king can't Definitely should. In c5. And he is going to be livid if he does not hold this, because that... That's just the wrong, wrong energy to have. You need to hold this draw. And I think he, oh, that wasn't maybe the best. No, Rook takes B3. Oh my goodness. And look at Lawrence. Look at Lawrence. He cannot believe it. He's beside himself. It, it's just not acceptable. He, he had the draw technique. It was just check, 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 back and forth. And Rook D3, don't, I don't think you can get away with that. So he goes King C4, that's smart. Now King He's just going to collect the pawn. Yes. Oh, that's a good wants, move, though. That's a really good move. Three. That's a really, really good move. But unfortunately, Roberto knew how to meet it. Just push that better one. On. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. This is going to be a loss for, for Lawrence. I, I think at this point, there's just too much time. Uh, and he's going to get Rook E1 check. Oh, OK. Rook may be checked, but same ideas. Yeah, you cut the king off. Now you build the bridge. So this actually is instructive for most of our viewers and how to win this end game. And look at the rook in d5. Don't trade the rooks just yet. The king would be allowed back in front of the pawn. You just wait. You bring your king in, and then you promote. So a win for Roberto. And we've been saying that a lot because I think it's been, well, at least three in a row, um, if not more. But yeah, I think three wins in a row for uh, Roberto Molino from Brazil. This is, this is crazy right now. Lawrence is just falling apart, and he's doing it at the worst time. This might be the last three-minute game. Imagine that this trends even more and more in Roberto's direction. It's going to be eight to six, and with, with just a collapse in the three-minute portion, that's not what you need going into bullet. No, it is not. And I will say that this type of position, it could get quite tactical. So I like how the opening has gone for Lawrence. But I wonder, Aman, was Lawrence like weirdly playing for a win there? Like, why would he bring his rook to c4 and then play push his a pawn? What was that about? I don't, uh, I don't know. I think, I think he was not playing for a win. Um, I think it was just, you know, he saw the opportunity, rook c4, good square for the rook when the king was there, and just sort of overestimated the the idea that you don't have to do anything when you're looking for a draw or you're looking to hold a position sometimes doing nothing is the best thing to do and he tried to do something and he didn't have anything to, to do and he just saw the ape on he's like well there's something i can throw off the board so i think it was just a product of trying to do something when nothing was necessary to, to do at all i think that's right i think that's what happened and for Lawrence, he probably was getting nervous at that point, and he pushed his pawn, thinking that he would lose it regardless, but that dropped the B3 pawn, which was an yep. issue. And now in this game, well, Roberto, I, I like how the opening went for Lawrence, but I don't like this position for him, because if we look at the quality of pieces and what squares can be ours for the taking, the light squares all over here are going to be under white's control. And he can take here, play pawn to b5, knight into d5, and what is black going to do about any of this? Rook to a1? Yeah, at this point, I think this is exactly where Roberto wants to be. Comfortable, playing a positional game. Uh, there's not a lot of dangerous tactics. I mean, there's still pieces on the board, but it's really reminiscent of that earlier game that they played. I think it was the second game of the match, where Lawrence had these exact two pieces on the board, a knight and a dark square bishop, and we were it was just a you know race. Can he activate them, make some threats, or is this going to be an end game? And here c5 looks very powerful. You can never take with the d pawn because the rook will land on d7, winning your yeah. queen. And he makes a retreating move, which is good because they attacked the rook. He just repeated once. That's a, a nice thing. Now bishop takes e5 as a threat if Lawrence didn't see it. 
That's a good, a great point. And C5. So the thing is, I think he went back to E4 because he noticed C5 after he did it. He was like, oh, let's go back, see if he goes back to A2. Now he <laughs> plays C5 anyway. And I actually like this decision from Lawrence, even though his position is bad, that he can't just get squeezed. Like this, he needs to do something with his pieces. And mm -hmm. sometimes you drop a pawn, but the rest of your pieces feel happier. Here at C5 is hanging, E5 is hanging, but look at this move, Rook A2. Like it's much more Lawrence's style to play in this manner. He defends with an offense rather than just yep. sitting passively. Yep. And I'm wondering what the follow-up is. If you move that queen too far away from that E pawn, bishop takes E3, bishop D4 happens, and that's that's over right there. And E4, reason that that's kind of an annoying move um, for white, actually, is that the bishop controls D2. So it's like it's kind of a hard pin to get out of, or it's just a little bit awkward here uh, for Roberto. Right, and if you go rook takes c5, there could be queen b6, if you're unaware of this. Whoa, what the, the bishop is hanging, but rook d7 check will win the queen. That is a brilliant move by yeah. Roberto here. Is rook a6 or queen a6 needed here? Ooh, both of those um, moves do not look fun, though. Bishop uh, takes yeah. e5, maybe? Just grab the central pawn? How else do we do it? I don't know. Um, yeah, rook d7 looks pretty strong just to trade queens. He might prefer that because the queens get off the board. <laughs> <laughs> that but is, bishop that e5 is, looks solid. That's a very Roberto decision to make, but right now he takes an e5. He, he has the sense that this match is really turning in his favor, and if he can win this game, the final game of the 3 plus 1 time control, he'll exit with a two-game lead, and he came into it you know, earlier in the match with a two-game deficit. So yeah. what a comeback it's been by Roberto. Yeah, and, and this three-minute portion, it says three and a half to two and a half. I'm pretty sure that it started with like a draw, and then it was two wins from Lawrence. So he has actually won four straight games, I think it, it might even be, or something to that effect. The point is, he has made an insane comeback in this three-minute portion. And if you can cap it off with a win here, then you go into the break, all that confidence, you're up two games, then the bullet happens where he probably thinks he should be the favorite. Um, Lawrence needs to tie this match right now because he has been letting his emotions get the better of him. Um, and, and I think he needs a win to get back on track. I would agree. And well, his king is on h6, so I don't know about winning this game, but Roberto and Lawrence about even on the clock. White's position is better. It's even material. Both sides have two rooks, queen, bishop, and four pawns. But there's a king on h6 out in the open. The c5 pawn, the c7 pawn, both are weak. And queen b2, I think, just wins on the spot, hitting the g7 square Ooh. and the rook on a3. Wow, queen b2 is a sneaky, sneaky move. Bishop g7 check. Um, I guess there's rook a8 there, but it still looked like a really good move. <laughs> yeah, maybe it didn't win. I looked at it, I was like, well, the g7 square is where I want to go, and it, it looks like it should be winning. This still okay, looks good. So, yeah, this looks fantastic. Um, still hope for Lawrence. Like, I, I would maybe go like bishop seven almost bishop f6 i think if you trade the the bishops is very very scary because the pieces just pile up on the on the c pawn white needs to also play like something like h3 um just to, to get an escape score for that king and what about this trade because this could turn into a position where let's say one more piece gets traded after the bishops uh mm -hmm. let's say the queens get traded and now you're up it would probably be up a pawn regardless. These one of the C pawns will drop, but is that enough material to win? That's a difficult. Love that move. Holy, sense. that's a good one. Rook yep. d eight because if you get a queen endgame, the king is tucked on h one, and you have a pass pawn that is a lot more mobile than that e pawn. The black king can catch uh, white's e pawn a lot easier than white's king can catch the c pawn with the help of the queen. And he could have traded rooks and taken the c five pawn, but the same situation would have existed where black would have been down a pawn but the c pawn with the queen would have started rolling up the board so here ooh, there's no way white can win this game the king is stuck in the corner and in fact lawrence might be able to somehow take this over if queen takes c5 is played rook d1 check so do not yeah. take that pawn if i'm lawrence yeah give up that pawn <laughs> it's almost too obvious <laughs> right <laughs> you shouldn't have attacked the queen lawrence you should have left yeah, it yeah. just randomly over there but c4 yeah, rook d2 C or rook d2 or c4 like keep pushing those pieces and mm -hmm. go after white's king the problem is black's king is also very exposed so there will likely be f4 and rook c5 oh f4 check was winning but queen f8 is also good so what's what's where's... the idea oh, oh he's my... just setting that up and queen e... queen c5 you win the rook queen c5 wins the rook he sees and... it lawrence is gonna is gonna exit this three minute portion 
in terrible <laughs> shape. Did you see that? He looked scared. Like he didn't even look surprised. He looked like he was frightened by what just happened. And he is distraught. He is devastated. Look at the guy. He's not even on camera anymore. Not even, he's not even there. It's the, the, the headless horseman. Wow. Wow. I'm <laughs> borderline speechless, but that game seems like if we just look at the conclusion there, Lawrence's reaction, you know, a blunder, all this stuff. But Roberto kept up the pressure throughout the game. And that was yes, a beautiful game. Towards the end there, he went astray. Lawrence was able to actually have a better position, more active position. But for the whole game, Roberto put him under pressure. And then in the end, he spotted tactics when Lawrence tried too hard to win. Yeah, and that setup with Queen F8, Rook F1, just to play the pawn to F4, that was beautiful. And, and Lawrence just, just collapsed in that three-minute portion. I mean, he looked frightened, as you said, like literally frightened to see Queen C5 on the board. That's like, you know, finding something weird out from Ancestry.com reports. I mean, <laughs> he looked surprised. And we are surprised as well that the leader of this match is actually Roberto going into the bullet. Uh, I mean, if there's anything uh, a tilted player wants to play, Robert, it's bullet chess. So I'm excited for the, the next portion. So am I. Everybody will come back shortly with the bullet portion of this match. It is a two-game lead for Roberto Molina, but Lawrence Trent has that aggressive style to mount a comeback. Stay tuned. We'll be back shortly.
We have yet to determine who will move on to the semifinals, but we know that it will be a tough battle between the winner of this match and the winner of Lars, Oscar Haug, and Teddy Coleman. Amon, what do you think? What do you think about this bracket? What do we have in store for the remaining matches? Well, it's a really uh, interesting question because the, the first round has finally been concluded. This is the uh, first look at these next set of matches. And Lars Oscar and Teddy Coleman, the thing about Teddy is, you know, you just can't bet against Teddy. He's such a solid player. He is just always, always in the match, no matter if uh, his opponent is much higher rated than him or not. Lars, of course, going in is obviously the favorite, but... Um, I don't think that that match is set and done. Lars did look a little bit shaky, however, showed up in the bullet portion. And whereas Roberto and Lawrence were waiting to be decided. But, you know, the, the winner of this match is going to face the winner of Lars and Teddy. So I, I think if we get a matchup like, for example, Teddy and uh, Roberto, it could just be the most solid match we've ever seen. And if we get Lars against Lawrence, it could just be tactics every single game. So I'm excited for that no matter what. For sure. And I know that many people out there are especially excited for the matchup between Levy Rosman, that is Gotham Chess, and Eric Rosen. Eric did win his game, his match, excuse me, yesterday against Sagar Shah. So that will be a fun one indeed between two of the best content creators out there and two friendly personalities that people I'm sure will have a very big rooting interest in. Yeah, no, we'll definitely see some uh, some firm opinions uh, about who they want to win that match. But for now, we're getting into the bullet section, Robert, of this match. And I, I mentioned and I, I meant it that, you know, what does a tilted player want to do? He wants to play bullet chess. Do you think this is going to bode well for him here, Robert? Look at this, 92 E5. I think he has chances, but look at Roberto's bullet rating. That is not a mistake. That is 28.59. So Lawrence has his work cut out for him, but I like the opening choice, even if I don't understand a single move play this far. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, basically what we see here is Lawrence has, uh, you know, a heavyweight uh, to take care of. A 28.59 in bullet. Roberto is no joke. And uh, this, everything we've seen in the match so far might just get accentuated in a bullet. So I think we're either getting a very close match or we could just see a blow up from Roberto. Yeah, I think that's a fair call. And right now, the position somehow looks relatively normal after the very strange start. White can put the pawn in d4 if he so chooses, put a knight on e5. We have an mm -hmm. IQP position. But I like that Lawrence is refraining from pushing the d pawn. The bishop on b2 is much stronger without that pawn in its path. Yeah, knight c4 just hitting that bishop. Uh, but we do see the knight getting into e5. The bishop will return at some point to, to b2, and there it goes. Rook e1, and those bishops eyeballing the king side. I think this is a position that Lawrence is probably happy to get. You know, it might not be the most sound, but hey, everything's pointing in one direction. You know where the action is. Well, if, there's, if there's ever a time for Harry Styles reference, it was after you just said one direction. But right now, I'm looking at the king side as well. G6 is a very scary move to have to play for black because that fish won't be two. Now it has the full length of diagonal. And I'm looking at tactics, right? If you remove yep. the knight from E5, knight G4, right? Just win the game on the spot. <laughs> that has to be E5. I was going to say it's the only try. Knight takes F6, queen takes F6, and run the king. Oh That's all we gosh. got. Can I just take on E5 instead? Like, can I just go knight back and take on E5? He doesn't. He goes to the H7 pawn. Okay. Yeah, probably not the most uh, forcing decision, but um, D4, if he controls that E7 square, keep in mind, guys, Queen H8 is checkmate in one. That's true. So actually, is Lawrence just winning another pawn? It looks like it to me. And if he gets a second pawn, then he's well on his way here. And he is. R Roberto's down 15 seconds. Yep. And uh, if that bishop ever leaves that diagonal, keep in mind, bishop A3 is also going to lead to, well, maybe, maybe, maybe more. No, Rook takes e5, Queen takes e5, and there's a back rank check. <gasps> oh my god. Oh, no, that's the commentator's current. Oh, and he missed it. Oh, he did oh, oh my I feel so much better. I was about to feel horrible that I just jinxed him. And Rook neither player e5. saw it. <laughs> How did both players miss that? I thought at least someone was, was setting that up. Wow. And the game continues, and Lawrence is up on the clock. He's up two pawns. He can push his pawn to d5, so king g7 is not a possibility here. And there's no second rank infiltration. There's no rook c2. It's super important. Yes. And just take on h6. You just win a pawn. Rook h8 check is a threat. Now d5, bishop f6 check. Everything is a problem yeah. for that black king. Oh, nice. And now d5. Beautiful. And just go. Rook h7, perhaps. Rook f6 yeah, also this is good. a good move as well. 
And what's the count? How many pawns is white up? Bishop d4. Three pawns. E5. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is great. He's simplifying as well. F7's hanging. I think Lawrence has got this game. Three seconds taking down. He, he's definitely got it. And just D takes C7. How many pass pawns does a player need? And you can't even protect F7. Rookie seven check is coming. And he wins on time. Wow. And we, this is how the entire match started, Robert. It was like, oh, wow. Roberto's coming in with 2750 blitz. Lawrence is the underdog. Boom. He absolutely crushed him game one. Same thing in the bullet. Talking about 2850 bullet. Lawrence comes in and says, hey, it's not about rating. It's all about the board, baby. And, and he comes in with an emphatic start to this bullet portion. Yeah, and right now it's only a one-point deficit, and this is the type of position that Lawrence likes. Trying to get active here, but I like Roberto's decision to go knight f3 to d2, trade off that menacing knight in the center. Now look at this. It went from potentially tactical to a positional battle because it's not yeah. opening up yet. And I'm not a fan of knight on g6. f4 looks like a great move because it's going to be followed up by exactly that. e4, knight takes e4, and already Roberto is dictating the pace. He is, and the queen on e8 is not happy to see the e-file open up. The rook on e1 will win that battle, and knight g5 comes to mind here. Yeah, Just trying to open up more of the board. The d6 pawn is hanging, so knight takes d6 can be played. F5 at this point. also looked quite tempting there, but hey, knight d6, you know, free pawn, open bishops. This is just commanding for Roberto. All right, so let's see. How can Black get back into this thing? That's what you have to come up with if you're Lawrence. You're down on the clock in addition to being down a pawn. So what can you do? If the light score bishops get traded, maybe then you feel like you have some hope. I like the move H5. It's just yeah, me too. creating vague threats of a kingside attack, and now he goes on the other side of the board. That's just, honestly, it's disorienting. Rook D3, hit the G3 pawn. Just uh, get, get involved in the position somehow. Rook E3 is sort of covering that third rank because of that. I liked your move to d3. That was probably better. And if this knight could just go to f5, black suddenly has a ton of compensation. But now the knight can't g4. get there. Can I take on f4? You just go bishop e5 and win my knight or something. Or queen g5. Yeah, or even if I don't win the knight, basically if I get you to play g5, I feel like someone's getting mated and it's not me. Yeah. And now queen g5 is a good move because if you take on f4 with the knight, bishop e5 happens, cutting off your discovered check, winning the knight on f4. Yeah, and I was going to say, I like b6 just to force Lawrence to say, look, are you committing to that diagonal with queen b8 or not? And I actually don't feel like this is so overwhelming for white. I mean, it should lead to an attack. Oh, oh that's rookie a 8. Rook. Rookie 8. What? Oh, okay, there's rookie 2. So you somehow protect the rook there. And I'm even looking at moves like rook to d5 there. It just doesn't work because the bishop will take it rather than the pawn. But wow, rookie 8 has to be played. Okay, it was rook, rook d8. d8, but now he's getting out of this. Yeah, and he's got no time. I would be moving the black king, uh, by the way, to like h7 or something, just like out of the way. That seems like a reasonable play. And it said rook to b3, so he keeps moving. I like this here. move, f6. That looks I great. I think that's strong. Well, if you move the rook, though, rook b1, check king f2, queen g3 mate. So just don't walk wow. your king up to f2, but actually the queen coming to g3 rook g5. is five. Rook, rook g5 rook definitely would check. lead to mate. Okay, he had to go rook b1 check first, I think. What? So both players Five are, seconds. Yeah, making mistakes in time trouble. Yeah. Lauren, Lauren's this is have, playable. Oh, it's very playable. He doesn't have time, oh but his position's okay. Watch out for bishop takes c6 as a sacrifice. If the rooks get traded... Oh, rook takes g2. Rook g2. <sighs> oh, my goodness. And now, and now rook a7's on. happening with bishop c6. Yes. And rook a8 first, good touch. Rook you have a7. To rook a1 check, rook a2. Something like that. Like, just pin yes. that bishop. Oh, the king's coming to g3. Oh, my gosh. Is there going to be a checkmate here? King, king g3? Yes. Bishop oh d5? Oh, my gosh. Bishop c4? Yeah, bishop c4, king e1. The king's running away, though. And oh, my this... goodness. What the hell is going on here? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. f7. This looks like it should be enough for white. You're up a piece now. The b7 pawn. Well, it's not b7 yet, Rook but it's b3. there now. Oh, a that's a queen, queen check. with check. Wow. Sheesh. Wow. What a great game. Lawrence is, is, is saying, look, I am here to play because he was absolutely in that match after looking out of it for the entire opening. That was that was beautiful uh, play by Lawrence to come back in that game. Roberto just made the better decisions, you know, towards the end of that match. But uh, what a game, Robert. 
and we have this opening that we saw in game one, and then we saw it again later in the match, and Lawrence has fixed it. He did not allow Black to play e5, instead he put e5 himself. White is down a pawn, but look at these pieces. Your minor pieces are dominant. You can castle, play knight g5, pay pawn h3 to trap that knight. Oh, knight h4. What a move. Taking away the f5 score and try to sacrifice in g6. Take that. Oh, for sure. Yep. And... Or B7. It's funny. I was looking at the king side, and he goes, Rook takes B7. I'm like, oh, okay, that's a free ball. hanging as well. Yeah. And now White must be thrilled because you've regained the material Bishop and G5. the king stuck in the center. Bishop G5, as you said. Excellent move. Where does yeah. that king go? Nowhere. Bishop F8, sad move to play. Yeah, sad, but maybe necessary. And how do I end this game? Do I just go, Queen? oh, Queen D3? Trying to just take this pawn at five. If e6, there might even be like a knight move to b5 or something. Knight crazy. e4? Knight e4. Or the queen's protected, actually. Uh, <laughs> be yeah. careful. <laughs> but knight, knight b5, you can't take the knight because queen takes b5 is mate. So knight b5 going knight c7 check could actually right. just pick up a bunch of material. Rook, Rook takes f5. <laughs> oh my goodness, what a move. Love it, though. Queen uh, takes f5 and just how do you defend? You can't. f7 is falling. And very importantly, the bishop on g5 covers the c1 square. So if there's ever any kind of queen c1 check, you just steal the queen. This is a nasty game. Lawrence is going to strike back right away, it looks like. Yeah, he's in fine form. And I see Teddy Coleman in the chat, and he says, does rook takes f5 work? So he was seeing the tactic that we weren't quite focused on, but look at this play by Lawrence Trent. Rook back to f1 is probably sufficient here. Whoa, queen g6! He's just going to take everything. But where is the mate? This is how winning positions can go wrong. Wait, he needed to take on e6, I think, there. Queen takes e6 to start. He probably did, but knight... No, knight c5 check his back as queen takes c5. <gasps> no! Queen takes c5! What a blunder. His oh! whole game is gone now. And Lawrence is in pain. He just grimaced there and... Wait, what? Wait, what just... Wait, sorry, what? Yeah, how did that just happen? Wasn't the Sorry, D4 what? the D4 pawn was hanging with check and mate, right? <laughs> Sorry, what just happened there? C4. Wait, now what's winning? Wait, How wait, that's an outside pass. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very confused. G4, and then just bring your king up, and then play bishop e3 to trade bishops at some point. Yeah, king e4, bishop e3. Although, actually, if you trade bishops, there could be a, a place where you can't get your king in. So you have to be a bit careful about that. So just king, can you just bring his king to the queen side? <laughs> I'm confused. Yeah, I think this is the right plan. I think this yes. is the good plan. Black's going to have to, you know, get his bishop to attack the e-pawn or something. Right, but c5 falls, and that's the second pawn, and now it's winning again. That's game over. What in the world did we just see? Bishop e3, and I would play a4. Nice move. Yeah, this is not easy. Even g6. L literally, what was that? How do you play queen c5, but not notice the fall? That's so strange. Wow. I wonder if he was just happy to regain some material. So he's like, okay, like I'm not dead lost anymore. And then he just didn't find the next follow-up, which actually led to a forcing checkmate. Goodness. And okay, so run the pawn to a6. I guess you may as well. Mm -hmm. uh, don't know about g7, but okay, it's all, all winning. Well, the a pawn is the wrong pawn. So if somehow the king can win the g7 pawn, you can run back the other way, but it's no, it's yeah. not nearly in time. He's got it. He didn't have to bring that bishop back, but I think he sees. Oh, you know, he sees bishop, nice that's, little touch there. Yeah, that's sick. That's sick. And nice now touch there. And if you're Roberto, do you just spend the next ten seconds? You waste the match clock. He says no. I don't think he feels I, comfortable exactly. right now. I was going to say the same thing. I, I think as Roberto, as the higher rated player, you want as many bullet games right now when the match is close as you can get. There's 13 minutes left. But Lawrence is leading the bullet. He entered down two games. Now he's only down one. And it has been such a nerve-wracking state of games where both players have winning chances, may blunder, then they're getting down to the limit of their time. But I feel like Lawrence has played better, honestly, in the bullet thus far. Yep, I agree. I agree. Just overall, even the games that go really bad for him, he had that one game. I just think that it's impressive. He's able to stay in and still generate winning chances at some point. Generally, if you play a bullet game and you have no winning chances ever start to finish, your opponent has played just a master class. Because uh, it's bullet chess after all of it. Things are going pretty fast. Completely agreed. And if we see this opening and how this has gone, at first I was going to say, hey, I like what Lawrence is doing, trying to play for F5. But then he made the move Bishop F6. Was that a mouse yeah. slip? Uh, I don't know. I feel like he 
he wants to put that bishop on g7, but that's only after seeing bishop f6. When the bishop's on e7, I wouldn't have ever suggested that. Yeah, so... Oh, look at that move. Yeah. Great exchange sacrifice. This is classy, everybody. If you take yeah. the rook on c6, the pawn takes back. The knight was actually trapped. And even if the knight were not trapped, it is still a worthy sacrifice. And now the rook on c6, that's so powerful. Yeah, and that's just bullet chess for you. You, you want to look for those nasty moves where you know, your opponent just can't see the good way to play. Um, it's all about having a plan and bullet. And Lawrence doesn't have a plan. He wanted to go for f5. No. He didn't do so. And now f5 is off the table because your king gets in trouble. He has to trade, right? Or b5, maybe? Okay, b5 is clever. And now the queen drops back. And now you're more willing to trade because yeah. the pawn on c6 fo followed by a pawn on b5, that would be a protected pass pawn. Now if you take back with the pawn on c6, that could become a target later in the game. Lawrence is playing a bit, a bit better. That b5 move was key, and I think he's starting to maybe uh, become optimistic about his position. And he does, in fact, take. Now, d takes c6. The d6 pawn is weak, and the knight is free to go to a5. But how does black really fend the position I like off? Knight, I like because like, knight a5 doesn't really make a threat, and hey, you know what Lawrence is up to. Knight f4, queen h3, stuff. Here it comes. Yep. And I thought queen b7 was going to be Roberto's move, just to trade queens before playing Agreed. c7. Instead, he pushed the pawn, which objectively should be good, as long as he doesn't get checkmated. And so queen the, takes the a8 is covering. a threat. Yes, yes, that's a I, great point. Queen takes a8 just wins right now. Although, uh, queen takes actually, c4? yeah, yeah, that's the chances you need. That's why he played f3. And that's a great move. The rook on c2 is also a nice defender. So now uh, queen, queen takes, takes a8. a8. He wants queen a7 check, by the way. That's why he did this, but... Um, maybe knight c5 after that. I don't know. Lawrence is very tricky with that move a5. You think and he Lewis, does nothing. Six seconds. He needs to move quickly. Queen a7 check. Yep. King f1, queen e3. You get scared. Oh my goodness. You queen e3. Time. Oh, no. Queen oh, e1 check be, coming. Oh, but the, queen e3. the knight's hanging on h3. But queen it's e1 hanging. Check. <gasps> <laughs> that's a move you get off. Fix. Oh, but that's queen e6. Queen takes e5 f6. check. There it oh, is. No. There it is. That's, that's all the game. needed. Yeah. Resign, Lawrence. You have to resign. Get a new game resign. going. Resign, resign, resign. Yep. New game. That's okay. I mean, it, even in these games, he has his chances. And it seems like with the white pieces, Lawrence has been way more confident. He has been, but now he changed his opening back to some Completely main lines. Changed. And I don't like this because it's very solid for black. It may be slightly better for white and you know, the two bishops, all that good stuff. But look at this. Yeah. The queens are on oh, the board. This is good for black. If you win this game, it's going to take you several minutes and 100 moves. Several minutes, 100 moves, great technique. I mean, just everything. And Lawrence, off to a good start, though. He has the pawn C4, D4, and now he plays G4, trying to use the bishops. But this is the problem. When you claim I have a two bishops advantage, is your light square bishop actually that strong? The answer is no, because all of Black's pawns are on light squares. That can be good if you can attack the pawns, but how are you going to attack f7? You can't. So look at this position. I think it's very pleasant for Black, yeah. even better. Bishop f6. Yeah, this is, uh, this is so, so brutal when you know, you got that two-game deficit and you're just looking at the position, you're just not happy with what you see. Now bishop f6 after rook h1, and you're even just worse. You're winning all this the pawns. Terrible. Oh, no. And, and the worst part about this is you can't make a draw anytime soon. Even if you are able to save the half point, which may not be likely uh, at this point in time, but it's going to take forever. So you have to sit there and watch your opponent try to play for a win and knowing that you have a very good chance of losing this after wasting like three more minutes, minimum. <laughs> That's right. And Lawrence, he can go rook h8, rook just start over to the queen side, attack those pawns. And maybe sure. now it's not that bad for him. It looks hard to press for black, but... Mm -hmm. Actually, how so does now, black try to win here? Um, maybe like rook h7, rook h3 with e4. That's, I think, the way to go, right? You need to push your past pawns, and your extra pawn is in the center. So a5 is a consideration for Lawrence, just to try to break down black's queen set pawn structure but he can also put his rook on d5 right and he's gonna get a bunch of checks lawrence is defending this really well he is he is and full credit there's 45 seconds apiece the only problem is there's so much shuffling going on right now the time is not going down here comes f4 and you have to go back right king e4 rook d4 checkmate that would not have been fun and the problem with playing f4 is now e4 is harder to accomplish, so you're not creating the pass pawn. But the good news is you kick that king back, as you mentioned, and that rook f8 check. Just keep checking this king. Rook back to e8. 
the worst part, Iman, is the 50 move rule counter restarted when F4 was played. And now mm -hmm. it's going again. But Lawrence is doing this perfectly. This is a draw. Yeah, it is. But I think Roberto is also doing this perfectly from the perspective of the match. Right. And uh oh, now you're dropping the C5 pawn. King takes C5. And then you just keep the king cut off. But you're <laughs> going to play so many more moves here. So many more moves. Rook C4 to D4. Get your king back involved. Or this. Yeah, and white just needs to keep the king cut off. So Look at the, like, it, you might not notice it, guys, but that match clock, it was like at 10 minutes when this game started, or, or more. This is really, really bad news for Lawrence. And you need to be able to start the last game. So right now, down two points. Let's say Lawrence wins a game with 10 seconds left. That's still good. He still gets that final game. So you're, you're very much keeping an eye on the match clock. And here, Lawrence is holding the draw. He's playing this very well. But it's getting lower and lower on the clock where he can't afford any more draws after Roberto this. can play until the match clock's at like two minutes. Um, yep. Literally, this could last four more minutes. Uh-oh. And here comes the king. Watch out. Rook, rook a3 was... Okay, or this is necessary. Yeah, then you can go rook a3 after king e3. Lawrence, he's doing a great job. Yeah, this is just a bunch of random moves, essentially, hoping that Lawrence goes wrong. And for Lawrence, he's just like, this is painful, but I am yep. digging deep and I'm holding this game. Rook D5 now. Rook D5. There we go. That's that's actually the first mistake from Roberto Molina. And now, now this is a lot easier. In fact, he's going to collect most of these pawns. Oh, yeah. man. The black can keep playing this after this. That's crazy. Maybe it was smart to lose that pawn. Oh, now he's going to lose the F pawn, and <laughs> Lawrence is going to play. Oh, my God. And it's still going to be a draw. What a move. Oh, oh, God. I thought it was a mouse slip, but no, that's a great move. What a wow. move. Rook G4. <laughs> By the way, why didn't Lawrence take that? Is he trolling? Take maybe, that. Make your draw. Yeah, maybe he's trying to win now. But that's ridiculous. Yeah, he should have taken. He's yeah, shooting himself good. in the foot. Dude, take, <laughs> take the rook. What are you doing? Okay. He just Ooh. wasted his own time there. Wow. Rook G4, though, that was excellent. Yeah, that's just like one of those moves that isn't necessary to play, but it's cool when you see it. That is 100% the best move in the position. And to see it in time trouble in a bullet scramble when yeah. this match is on the line, that was well done by Roberto because all of a sudden, Lawrence won one pawn and was about to win the second, and then he really could have tried to play for a win. But Roberto, yeah. he is too smooth there. He finds a way out. And Queen F3, the D4 pawn, can I capture that at some point soon? Talk about smooth. I mean, look at these games that he's got. What, Lawrence, where's the conviction? We need, we need uh, like F five in that position. We need E five. I don't know. We need C five. We need moves because look, the clock is ticking down. It's four minutes, and this is just a boring, everything defends everything position. Yeah, F five was a really good move there. Probably would have won black a pawn, but maybe yeah. Lawrence just saw what Roberto did. He said, "Hey, you know, piling up on the D file and trying to uh, outplay my opponent." End game sounds about right, but now D six. This, um, this is just not good. By, by Lawrence. Queen d2, take, trade a pair of rooks, pawn on d5. This move is fine as well. Like, it's just, uh, this is the wrong, wrong stuff, I think. And nice move, the rook d6. If you took on d5, queen takes d8 was possible, and two rooks for the queen. So instead, we have this position where it's a solid position for black. White can't really move because you don't want to drop the d5 pawn. And look at Lawrence go, though. He's bringing the c pawn up the board. I think he has some chances here as he activates all of his pieces. Uh, I think that this is a really bad position to be in for Lawrence. This looks like a like a oh, rook d5. Hello, what's going on here? Oh, takes and takes on b5. Yeah, there's a queen e8 check right at the end just to win the b5 pawn. Yeah, yeah. He, but this she, this is just gonna go forever. It's so so unfortunate. King somewhere. He should have played c4 instead of taking on d5. He actually had chances to outplay uh, Roberto. And I'm looking at the match clock. Two minutes and almost 50 seconds now. He need, as soon as he finishes his game, he and if it's a draw, he will need to win the one, the next one very quickly because yeah, he may run out of time. It, it just won't be possible. I, I, this is a bad sign. Um, the reason he took that is he wants to make the draw quicker. And if you trade the queens, you can do that. However, someone can absolutely still win this game. Right, and that someone looks more likely to be Roberto, whose king is far more active. Let's say you play mm -hmm. F3, play G4, and there are some tricks here. Yeah, he's going for G4. He's going to play A3, G4. What? I think so, at least. Well, the A3 move, I'm a little nervous to play because it brings it closer to the enemy king. But this, okay, F5. 
Okay, this is <laughs> well, it's getting close here. If you play a three and then a five, a four, then white wins. So a three, right. play a six, and a four, a five. Wow. Right. But now <laughs> f four check. Now you play pre- fifty moves. Yes, and if then, you're if you're Roberto, oh, play fifty moves. It's over. The match definitely. is over. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Oh man, you want to tilt Lawrence Trent? This is the way to do it. He's played forty nine moves, and then let your minute expire, and the game, the match is over for sure. Right. And honestly, at this point, it already looks over because a minute and 40 seconds. <laughs> this but... is a master class on how to send Lawrence Trent into orbit. <laughs> yes, because the pawns take away all of the squares from the enemy king. And Roberto did the right thing, playing out 50 moves. And he could have wasted oh, he all could of have the time. All of the time. Yeah, he could have just sat there at the end. Right. He could but, have sat there at the end. You know, now that the match is his for the taking... He could score a couple extra bucks if he wins the final game. Because <laughs> the thing is, if you're going to be the guy who plays those king moves, and no judgment for me at all on that, but if you're going to be that guy, why not also just waste the extra minute at the end? I mean, there's there's no reason you don't just end the match right there. And it is the right match strategy to play that out. It would have been, it's, you know, it may seem improper or whatever because they can agree on a draw, but it would have been bad for Roberto's chances because let's say they drew that game quickly and then Lawrence wins and he's time for one more game. You're doing a disservice to yourself. Mm-hmm. By the yeah. way, this position is just completely dominating for Black. Yeah, unfortunately, like this pawn is a goner and it's just all going to be uh, queen side play. But Lawrence uh, is not giving it his all because he knows that the match clock is going to expire. I think, I think he's very conscious of that. And like I said, Roberto, a couple extra dollars because the winner gets half of the prize fund for winning the match, and then the other half is split by win percentage. So a final victory uh, gives him a little more money. And for Lawrence, you know he's going to be just gutted after this. And we'll have both players on for an interview, of course, like we always do. But Lawrence, you know, he was up two games at two different points, and he was storming back in the bullet, but yep. it wasn't enough. And Roberto just too powerful. Yeah. There comes the A-pawn. Basically, you had to stop uh, the pawn from getting to A2. This is over. Yeah. And he even stops for B3, and okay, the match is over. Both players know it, and Lawrence knows that he had every chance in this match, Robert, to, to make a comeback, to win this thing. In every format, he was impressive. He started out the five-minute ahead. Wait a minute. He started out the five-minute, the three-minute, and the one-minute with, with a lead? It's pretty yeah. impressive. And, you know, he, well, he got to the one minute, then he was, he lost the thread in the, the late stage of the three minute. And that's when Roberto had the lead, but we oh, were right. meant like he was ahead in each format. So like he started five minute and in the five minute games, he would, he started out with the lead in the three minute games. He started out two and a half to half right. and in the bullet, he started out with the win. So it's kind of like he had the, the hammer, so to speak, uh, to start things off. For sure. For sure. He came out. In a winning streak, that's absolutely the case. And we'll be right back because we're going to bring both the players in for a post-match interview. will be very interesting to hear their thoughts, and especially from yeah. the emotional Lawrence Trent, but he gave it his all. Did.
and welcome back, everybody. We are uh, lucky to be joined by the players here for a post-game interview. That's uh, Roberto Molina and Lawrence Trent uh, are here with us. And first of all, of course, uh, congrats to Roberto for coming away with the match victory. But I'm actually going to go over to you, Lawrence, the, the emotions from you. We can see them on the camera. So I know that there's probably a lot of thoughts going through your head. Uh, can you just uh, take us through the, the match, maybe in your eyes? Because we, we were just witnessing you on camera going all over the place, reacting to some of those blunders, uh, flags, unfortunate situations that happened. How do you feel? Yeah, basically, if I didn't blunder a piece every game I played, I might be a good chess player. You know, um, I'll be honest, I felt like I played in general pretty, pretty darn good chess. I just blundered all the time. I lost on time in positions I shouldn't have lost. Roberto was extremely fast. He put me under pressure. I don't feel like Roberto completely outplayed me, though, from start to finish. I just was hanging pieces. And that game where I was the pawn up with the pawn on E4 and losing that was just uh, shocking. Um, I was actually really happy with the way I played in general, uh, bar the just ridiculous blunders. And if I cut those out, I win the match by a by a long margin, but credit to Roberto, you know, he, uh, he stuck in there even when he was, uh, he was worse and uh, even when he was behind. And then there was that stretch where he won four in a row that really took it out of me. We went into the bullet where he had a two point advantage and uh, you know, I tried, I, tr I tried, but it, he was just too quick. He was just a little too sharp in the bullet and I just couldn't get the, uh, couldn't get the, the, the margin closer. So, you know, congrats to Roberto. But I do feel like, like I've lost a lot of matches before, but I'm, I don't feel too bad with this one because there were just so many stupid, blood, I mean, literally the most ridiculous hanging pieces, hanging rooks, getting flagged. How many points did I just burn? Um, right. Those, you know, I don't, I, I feel like there were only a handful of games where Roberto truly outplayed me without me blundering a piece. That's my interpretation. Maybe he's, uh, he thinks something different. Well, Roberto, on your end, you know, first of all, congratulations. You played, a, both of you played an excellent match. And I want to ask you, because early on, the games were very tactical, but then there were some games where you just said, no tactics for you, I'm going to squeeze. The second game of the match, for example, and others as well. Was that part of your strategy to avoid tactics and to play more strategic battles? Yeah, uh, first of all, uh, thanks for the opportunity to play again. And yeah, uh, general, uh, I am a positional player and I prefer, for example, chain queens <laughs> play the end game. But in the beginning of the match, uh, I, can't, I can't do that. Um, and uh, he made me the two first games. And the, the preparation of opening is total disaster in the, in the beginning of the match. But I put my red in the right place and tried to, tried to fix this problem. For example, change some moves or the, in the opening. Right. Yeah, it, it seemed like maybe you adjusted some of the uh, openings that Lawrence was playing, he was able to get like really good attacks, especially in the early portion. Um, would you say that uh, Roberto in the uh, in the bullet, was that a, a format that you were expecting to uh, be able to do better than Lawrence in? Like you were trying to keep the match close in blitz and then wait for the bullet portion to score some points? Uh, I, I think I just play one game after one and the game and I, I don't uh, have a plan to, for example, win the match in bullet. I just play one game and another and another, just this. Uh... Yeah, I mean, my, my match plan, obviously, I looked at Roberto's games. He is a very positional player. He likes drier positions. So it was absolutely clear to me that I had to take him uh, it, you know, into a dogfight and, and get things messy from the off. And I, I was actually really happy with uh, with the openings I chose. And I, I think if you remember my match against Danny, where he didn't adjust, Roberto adjusted immediately. And that made a huge yeah. difference, I feel. Um, yeah. he, he adjusted from game three. He didn't give me too many chances. I had to work a lot. And there were a lot of these dry positions where I just made 
classic mistakes. I mean, blundering the rook on d4 to allow rook a8, mate allowing the pawn yeah. on h6. All of this stuff in blitz, which you shouldn't allow, I allowed. And, you know, ultimately, it was the blunders that cost me, although I think the, the actual match was was super close. And if I'd avoided those, I think uh, think I would have won. But that's, that's the way it goes. It's blitz. Um, yeah. At least... At least it was extremely competitive, and I think the audience was, would have had a great time watching these games because there was. I can't wait to look at these games back because there are a lot of fireworks everywhere. <laughs> Even my first game, I wanted to throw my mouse out the window because I went king g3 and I wanted to go knight g3. Obviously, it was just a mouse tip. Obviously, I'm not going king, king g3. King I wanted uh, knight g3, knight e4. But anyway, I mean, there was super, uh, super fun games. The one where I had the queen on h for all of this. So I enjoyed myself, you know. And credit to Roberto, as I say, Thanks. stubborn guy, uh, tough guy to, to beat over a long stretch. Three hours is a long time. It's very intense. And uh, I wish him all the best for the, for the rest of the competition. Thanks. Uh, uh, the, the, the change mind in the, for example, the Karokan defense, uh, this opening is my main uh, yeah main weapon and yes. you crushed me in the first game i i, I think what it was not what time. can i do now <laughs> <laughs> my main line it was crushed um, but I, 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 looked at this, I looked at it's amazing i do more preparation for these matches than when i played for my gm norms that's not even an exaggeration yes. uh, <laughs> but uh yeah no i mean super fun games a mix of everything so well, uh, yeah, I'll go away with uh, my head held high. Lawrence, quick question about that, actually, because we were very impressed with both of your play. It was a pretty hard-fought match. and never felt like any side was uh, running away with it. But you mentioned GM norms. You very publicly tweeted about how, you know, now's the time I'm going to really dig deep and try to make that Grandmaster title. Yeah. What has your work been like? How have you been preparing? Because it, the preparation for this well, match looked I, good. What's your yeah. overarching uh, plan looking like? Well, I mean, this, I mean, just playing matches like this really gives you the taste to want to go for it. So uh, basically what I'm doing is I'm waiting it out just a little longer until COVID uh, is, is a bit more clear. Uh, obviously, traveling around is still a little bit tricky. Um, so it's really, I'm, I'm looking towards the summer. I'm going to be getting uh, getting a, a very famous coach to help me. I've already reached out to him. He's already agreed. Um, and it's time to go for it because I, I think, you know, if I cut out the silly mistakes, uh, you know, I can see it myself. I can really play with these guys. Roberto, he's 2750, 2800, 2850 blitz player. And he's, he's, he's a super strong blitz player, super strong player in general. And yeah, as I say, um, it's going to be a, a lot of adjustments to get this GM title because I've got a lot of points to make, 100 points. Uh, got to get a norm, uh, and it basically means effectively dropping everything else, uh, doing doing a little things on the side, but for the most part, just full 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 steam ahead. And I really want it now. I'm in the, in the right place in my life where I can do it. I've got the flexibility to do it, so I'm just going to do it. Uh, just got to grab the ball by the horns. Aman did it a few years ago. I remember sweating Aman, you know, yep. playing in all these Swisses and Isle of Man and everything else. I saw him everywhere grinding it's going to take a crazy amount of volume to get it as well i'm probably gonna to have to play 200 games at least to even have a chance um you know but hard work uh and and finding the love for the game it's about that love and, and, and even today i really loved it i really enjoyed playing some of those games so that's what it's going to need and hopefully fingers crossed look if you're out there and you're a naysayer you're a debbie downer you're a you're a you're you know you're a non-believer. You know where I'm at at Lawrence Trent. I am on Twitter. Hit me up. <laughs> lines ready. I've He'll got a professional. I've got a professional handicapper who's doing the lines. He's done all the spreadsheets. It's all ready. I will. T I will back myself. If you don't think I can do it, come and hit me up because I've got a surprise for you, my friend. I'm going <laughs> to take that money and I'm going to say I told you so. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like that attitude for sure. And Roberto, on your side, uh, you're clearly a very strong player. I believe you have a couple of norms. What are your aspirations like? Are you trying to become a grandmaster as well? Yeah, of course. I have two GM norms, and uh, I, I just be studying, streaming uh, some class uh, and focus to improve my chess. But the problem here in Brazil uh, don't have. Uh, 
tournaments. Uh, I don't, don't know when I will play again for GM norms. I think I need to travel uh, to Europe. So I don't know. But I, I am studying for improve, to improve my chess, just this and the screen, just this. Sounds like a, a good plan. I guess we, we obviously wish you both the best and hope that we can never invite either of you to this tournament ever again. Um, <laughs> I am not a GM tournament, but you are going to be continuing, uh, Roberto, in this event. So you're moving on to the next round. You're the first player uh, to win their second round matchup, and you'll be playing either Lars Oscar Haug or Teddy Coleman in the next uh, round. Have you seen either of their previous matches, or do you know about anything, uh, anything about them as players? Yeah, I, I saw the, the game, uh, just a little bit, of course, but uh, now uh, I need to study, the, for example, the openings and the style of play, the positions, uh, and uh, just wait for the next opponent. Right. Sense. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good way to do things. Take it one <laughs> match at a time, as you said. Uh, I, I echo uh, Robert's uh, comments earlier about how the match was honestly one of the highest level matches we've seen. Every match has blunders, but seriously, this match was back and forth, and it never felt like it was clear until literally the last game uh, of the match. So a big congrats to both of you. Lawrence sounds like he had a great competitive time, even uh, taking the loss there. So best of luck on the GM quest for both of you, and, and thanks for taking the time to play and, and share your thoughts. Congrats again to, to you, Roberto. Thanks very much. All right, and we've heard from the players there. It's uh, really nice of them to take take their time. And Robert, nice to, see, uh, ni nice to see. Nice to see Lawrence just have so much to say, complimentary to his opponent, as well as indicating, hey, if I can play chess like this, I'm I'm ready for the GM title. Yeah, no, the level of play was super high in this one. It's almost it unfortunate was. that this was the matchup in a sense for both players because they could have been eliminated. And it's not that there are any easy matchups, but just something about the stylistic imbalance here gave both players chances. We saw them thrive in their respective elements. And Roberto, when all was said and done, it did seem like he just barely eked this one out and he was a deserved champion. So I it wouldn't have been surprised no matter who won this match. And now that Roberto has won, you ask him, what does he think about the remaining competition? After what we saw today against a determined Lawrence Trent, yeah. I'm not going to call him the favorite, but I don't see why anyone would be favored over him either. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. As uh, he moves on in the bracket and uh, we'll see who he's up against. There's lots more of these matches coming up. We've already highlighted and previewed some of them, but what an exciting match today. I think coming into this match, you called it and you were pretty much spot on that this was one of the hardest ones to guess who was going to be uh, the winner because we know that Lawrence can come in and not be playing his best and maybe it's a whitewash. But when Lawrence is focused and he was today, he said he does more prep for this than his GM norm tournaments. Uh, and I love to see Lawrence when he's that motivated uh, playing that type of chess. So I thought that Lawrence is showing in this entire tournament, his match against Ganey, as well as this one is something to be proud of. Absolutely. And for Roberto, you know, in the post-match interview, essentially he was just very casual about it. So, you know, I'm studying, I'm getting yeah. ready. I'm always working on my chest. I'm streaming now, which is great to hear. And I hope that he continues his success because that level of play that we saw today, I, I know it sounds like we've mentioned it many times, but it's just true. I was really impressed by how sharp both players were early in the game or in the match, I should say, Roberto was finding these pins out of nowhere and just being tactically alert. And Lawrence was drumming up play out of nowhere, coming up with blistering attacks with that one game with Queen D7, Knight F4, Queen H3, where Roberto ended up losing on time. So both players showed their strengths. I think that blunders, as you mentioned many times, they happen, right? We expect that to happen. But I was like really thrilled to see both players compete so fiercely. Yep. And this was a. Uh... You know, that, that'll be it for us, wrapping uh, things up here. I guess the match finished 12 to 9 uh, overall. So uh, Roberto Molina is going to move on to the next round. And uh, when those matches happen, you know, either Robert and myself or another commentary team will be here to guide you through the, the tricky calculations and bring you all the action. But Robert, it was a pleasure, pleasure as always today. Uh, this was probably one of the most exciting matches chess-wise that I've had the pleasure to commentate. 
yeah, and there's, I can't think of anyone else that I'd rather jump back in my chair alongside when <laughs> some of these shocking things happen. But I'm on, seriously, it was a great time. The players treated us, so it made our lives easy. And thanks, of course, to all of the fans who continue to tune in, watch these players, root them on. We can feel yep. your energy, so we really appreciate that. Yep, well, take care, guys. Um, there's going to be lots more of these matches coming up, so make sure to uh, stay tuned in. And, of course, there's uh, all those regular chess.com events that are coming up, as well as the regular ones on the calendar, Title Tuesday, Arena Kings. So just so much chess happening, guys. Stay tuned. And uh, that's all for us for now. Take care, guys, and we'll see you next time.